The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Oh, yeah! This is the Cigar Authority. Have uh, you any imported cigars? The authority on everything cigar in and out of the cigar industry. We're on a mission from God. With your host... A jelly donut! David Garofalo. How did it get here? Mr. Jonathan. I hear you, <laughs> and I care. Barry Stein. I'm just going to use my spare glove compartment underwear as a napkin. And Ed Sullivan. They don't have a listing for Mr. Wonderful. What uh, spelling did you use? It's time to light them up. Smoke if you got them. It's time for the Cigar Authority. I got a fever, and the only prescription is more cowbell. Light them up, light them up, light them up, everybody. Saturday, January 26, 2019. Tobacco farming in the Connecticut Valley has a long history. When the first settlers came to the valley in 1630s, tobacco had already been grown by a native population. With us is the man who loves the history, taste, and life in Connecticut. The wise man, El Wawense, Nick Melillo from Foundation Cigars, is here with us. Welcome, everybody, to the Cigar Authority. Thanks for having me, guys. It's Thank a pleasure you. to be here. And you're listening to the Cigar Authority, now in its ninth year, making it the longest continually running cigar podcast, awarded the Ambassadors of Cigars by Cigar Journal Magazine, awarded the top 10 educational podcast by Podbean four years in a row. The Cigar Authority is the most listened to cigar podcast in the world. Cigar Radio at its finest. The Cigar Authority is a proud member of the United Podcast Network. You catch the podcast on demand at any time or our daily blog at thecigarauthority.com. Nick Bolillo, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. This is a pleasure to be here. This is getting to be an annual thing, maybe, hopefully. I would love to. I uh, flew right. in right from Nicaragua to wow. be here. So, um, you right. know, once you guys told me, I said I wouldn't miss it for, for the world. All right. You were the perfect one. This was actually, this show is a... A listener who wrote in to us and said, why don't we do a show where we talk about the history of Connecticut tobacco? And Ed Sullivan, our producer, said, I know the perfect guy that would be the perfect person, and it's you. That you uh, not honor. only love it, you grew up there, and uh, then you moved to Nicaragua. You've been all around the world, and you end up back in Nicaragua, back in Connecticut, and not only just in Connecticut, but your offices are on a tobacco farm. That is true. That was my dream from the beginning. So, wow. um, you know, starting the company three years ago, I said, we have to have our home offices in the heart of the Connecticut River Valley in Windsor. So, uh, yeah. It's awesome because that's where it all happens, folks. When you talk about this tobaccos uh, and he'll get into all of that, this is where it happens. So he's the perfect person. And what a perfect cigar to start the show off with today is a new tabernacle that's out there. Barry, tell us a little about it. And Nick will correct you after you're done. I'm sure that'll happen. <laughs> yeah. uh, today's first cigar is the Tabernacle Havana Seed Connecticut Number no. 142, and it's manufactured in Nicaragua for Foundation Cigar Company. We're about to light up the 5x50 Robusto, and it features a Connecticut-grown Havana Seed Number no. 142 wrapper, San Andreas binder, fillers from Nicaragua and Yamastron in Honduras. A cigar, single cigar, will set you back 10.69. Why a box of 24 is $226.99, which is a savings of almost $30 or 12% off the box price at twoguyscigars.com. If you're too far away from a brick and mortar retailer that carries it, try twoguyscigars.com. That's the number two, guyscigars.com. Wow, so we're looking at a three country <coughs> blend here. That's true. Three country yes. blend. Okay, yes. it's time to cut our cigar. The official cutting brought to you by Perdomo Cigars. Perdomo is the brand. While all other cigar brands were raising prices, Perdomo cut out the federal S chip tax and actually lowered them. Perdomo Cigars, they stand for quality, tradition, and excellence. Excellence. So, what did he get wrong there? You know, he did a pretty good job. Okay. Uh, he had all the details right on. You know, the, the Cuban seed we're going to get into in a little bit was uh, brought to the Valley 1870s. And I actually learned through my research uh, yeah. recently, which I hadn't read before, the U.S. Department of Ag Agriculture actually distributed the seed in Connecticut at this time. So um, this is one of the varieties of that seed called 142, which was actually hybridized with other Cuban seeds in the valley to become more resistant to black shank in the ah. field. So that's one of the, instead of using different fertilizers or pesticides, is to develop the seed so it's stronger in the field. So How this, long has this been used? 
This is this seed has been used for the past um, 50 years, but not really. Nobody has grown this one. I actually found it in the the vaults of the Connecticut Experiment wow. Station um, because there's all different types of varieties of these seeds throughout the past yeah. 100 plus years, and this one really took to me because the oils, uh, the body of the leaf. Well, you've been around a long time. You remember in the 90s, black shank was a major problem there in Connecticut. Major problem. Yeah, yeah major problem. I think so, it's bad getting shanked in prison. Try getting shanked on the field. Oh, man. You can lose your lose it uh, all. You can lose it all. Lose Literally. it all. Literally, yeah. All right, let's light her up and let's see do what this it. is about. First off, in the dry taste here, very sweet, very um, raisiny. It's a it's a like a bourbon and molasses, r- molasses. barbecue rub with a little of uh, maybe like a, a lemon rind thrown in there. Lemon that, zest. I love it. I love it. I'm, I've been telling people compared to the broadleaf tabernacle, this Cuban seed is more like your rye compared to your, your regular bourbon. Ah. The insides of this is different, though, in, in your regular tabernacle, too. So yeah. this is an altogether different cigar. Well, there's similarities between the, the broadleaf, but definitely because of the wrapper change, uh, the blend had to be tweaked accordingly okay. to accommodate for the wrapper. So you have different visos in... Ha- in Hamastron tobacco? In there's the, a little bit of Hamastron, yeah. In this, but not in... There is in oh, the other in both. one also. Oh, I yeah, didn't know that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you have different variations of, of some visos from Jalapa and Esteli, um, and the binder remains the same also. But again, very different wrapper. Different animal compared to the broadleaf. We're okay. going to light our cigar today with the Vertigo Intimidator. This is a four jet color changing lighter with the patented Vertigo big ass tank, easy adjustment at the bottom, and a neck that could be straight. Or if you're going to use it like Barry does as a pocket lighter to impress the ladies, <laughs> you just bend it a little bit to the right there and you're good to go. There we go. Curved for it's her the pleasure. Vertigo Intimidator. Don't be intimidated. For twenty four ninety nine. That's the amazing thing there. The big ass tank. Mm. That's right. Yeah. Other lighter companies have tried to come out with big ass tanks yeah. and they get sued. They can't do it. This is no. patented. This is the patent. Patented technology. Because he told them that. Every time I go say to the the guy at IPCPR trade show to say it, and he goes, why? And I said, just say it. Because <laughs> it's your commercial. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a nice line. <laughs> Some of these things just stick, and that's it. Would you say that this tabernacle is more or less strength-wise than... And and what would I call it? This is, you know, I say the regular tabernacle and this is... So tabernacle broadleaf, and then you have the tabernacle Havana seed. Okay. Connecticut. It's kind of a long name, the Havana seed, but I really wanted to make sure people understood it was Cuban seed grown in the Connecticut River Valley because it's very unique in that respect. Okay. Yeah, because you have a lot of Cuban seeds all over. Well, when I had heard you were coming out of Connecticut, I was very excited, and I thought I was going to get a shade tabernacle. And then this came in, and I said, I, they put the wrong cigars in the box. And then a Havana seed, and I said, okay, but boy, this looks the same. You know, it has similar looks. There's a little bit of a rosado yeah, tint to a, it. Yeah, there's a little tinge And there. when you see it in the beginning stages, it has much more of a rosado uh, tint to it. But if you compare them, you'll, you'll definitely see that rosado tint to the wrapper. All right. Toothy, um, toothy. It's very toothy, yeah. very oily. This is the, the difference between this and the, the broadleaf. The broadleaf is much bigger. The vein, vein structure is much bigger. Um, this is a lot thinner, narrower. You get better yields in, in the fields, but it's tremendously oily. The, the leaf. So it's thin, but you have a tremendous amount of oil. This is what takes so long for it to ferment. This has been fermenting for three years. Ah, uh, that was just you know, ask that we, question. We launched it at the show in, in July. We were hoping it would come out in the fall. It just wasn't ready, and it just started chipping in December. Um, because you have to be very careful with the leaf in fermentation because that layer of oil, there's a window about this big when it's ready. If you take it too far, it's over. Yeah. It's over. And then yeah. you over-fermented the tobacco. There's no flavor left, and it literally will disintegrate. If it's too early, it's not going to have the combustion. Um, sometimes the flavor is there. will be a little bit green. So it's a very delicate wrapper to use. You don't see many people using this style because no. of the time it takes okay. in fermentation and because it's so difficult in the fermentation. So you're, you're looking at seeds, and you're like, oh, I, I think I'd li- like to do an experiment with this. And mm-hmm. now you're looking at a minimum four-year proposition before you know if it's something that's usable yeah if you want to do it if you want to do it right 
Um, yeah, I had worked with other varieties of it, and I was familiar with this seed variety. So, is I this kinda, an is this an answer to the broadleaf that you can't get it? It's tough to get, and here's something maybe you can get. No, this is also difficult to get. All um, right. And again, because it takes so long, so you're planning in production. Imagine you're planning three years out, and you know, something hasn't even the, sold yet. You're correct. Um, so it's actually more difficult than broadleaf to cure. Uh, but it's just something, you know, being from the from Connecticut yeah. and the Valley, and I just, I'm in You're love the geek with this of leaf. geeks. Yeah. You should try Pick. Sumatra or something. You can get a hold of it. You're right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Make life easier for you. But it's it's a unique taste. There's no doubt, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's different than the other. Um, I did smoke both of them, one in one hand, one in the other, to say, you know, they, they look similar. What is the difference here? They taste different. I would say this is uh, more up my alley. That, that it's maybe toned down a bit. Yeah. It's, it's still there with some power, but toned down a bit. Uh, I like it. Yeah. Wow. That's I an like honor. It, it is. <laughs> That's an I honor. don't throw them around. I, they're like sewer covers, man. Of, of, <laughs> that, you know, a fuller body cigar that is up my alley. There's not a lot. Yeah. So I like it. Um, so let's get into the history of the Connecticut tobacco. Let's do Why this. you love it. And why should we? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I love it. I'm, I'm a little bit biased being from Connecticut, uh, New Haven. So, you know, the cigar history in New Haven, factory-wise, all my grandparents, great-grandfathers, you know, smoked Connecticut cigars. So yeah. that's sort of how it was introduced for the love of cigars was through my grandfathers. And then I just started diving into the history, the culture of Connecticut tobacco, which is, you know, it's one of the only places in the United States that grows cigars our tobacco, uh, whereas and people always ask, of all places in the United States, why there? So Connecticut, Connecticut, the actual word Connecticut is a Mohawk word uh, that means alongside the great tidal river. So this is really where the story starts in this period of time called the Pleistocene era. This was an era from about 2.5 million years ago until about 11,500 years ago, where when this glacier receded, first it left this lake, which a lot of people don't know about, called Lake, Hitch lake Hitchcock, which was a very large uh, lake. If we go to slide two, please, you can, <laughs> you can actually... So uh, these people that are watching us on YouTube... Uh, one more, Ed Sullivan. You can uh, see some Uno pictures mas. that they have, those that we'll explain. One more. More. Sorry. We'll explain. There, there, we, go. Go. there so, we go. So this is the, the lake. As you can see, when this started to recede down through the north of Connecticut, that was the largest part of this lake. It was almost like a funnel, you know. And then as it started to recede, it left the Connecticut River. We're looking at 406 miles long, the largest river in the northeast. When it came through the north of Harford, left these perfect meadows for growing black tobaccos, cigar yeah. tobaccos, because of this sandy loom soil that was left from this this great lake yeah, along all the nutrients that yeah. got pulled off the mountains it funneled right through to yeah. about 30,000 acres in that Windsor Windsor uh, area of Connecticut and just left this sandy loom soil so you're looking at a very large portion of sandy loom and then clay about let's say one quarter compared to three quarters of sandy loom so you get this irrigation of water through the soil where the plant is able to establish a very large root and strong root system to grow really healthy tobacco. Um, and that's really where it, where it started in Connecticut. So everything grows good in Connecticut? Well, this valley, when the settlers first came in, you know, the 16, 1630s there, yeah, everything was growing really, really well. And then people really started to take uh, onto tobacco at that time in the 1630s, um, 1635. Sorry, I'm not really going along That's all right. well with my, uh, <laughs> with my slideshow. That's all right. Um, but we, he, he took this serious, folks. We asked him to come in and tell us about it. <laughs> And he brought it back, as you as you heard, to uh, 200 BC, 2.5 2, 2. million years ago. <laughs> yeah, so I, which I thought we'd start like in the 1990s, but we're gonna we're gonna stop back there. We'll this get might there. take a while. We'll get get comfortable. Which which is interesting about that time period, 2.5 million years, is that's when the first fossilized tobacco was actually found. Amazing. Which is. Uh, we're going back now. Two slides. Yeah. Um, it was found by a um, Dutch um, 
actually this Dutch gentleman, Klaus Mitrani was his name from Peru, discovered the saber-toothed tiger, uh, I forgot the name of the shark, the Meg Megalongdung or something shark, <laughs> that was a gigantic shark at the time. He found uh, fossilized tobacco in Peru, wow. which makes sense because it, that climate at that time would be able to handle it because the north and south were too cold. And then over time, the migration of Homo sapiens really is the story of tobacco across the land bridge into the Americas. Yeah. And then we're looking at like 2 BC, 5 BC. It's really debatable when they really started cultivating tobacco because a lot of this history was you got lost. It dialed in within a couple of years there. That's, that's yeah, not bad. You no, know, that, was, that <laughs> was what we see in some of you know, actual writings, and we have hard proof of it that in Connecticut, in this area, um, indigenous tribes started yeah. actually using tobacco and smoking. You know, smoking really evolved, we think, out of this smudging ritual, which was basically where you were lighting different plants and herbs in a spiritual ceremony to sort of purify your your temple your yeah. your 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 space there so that smudging was basically you'd light you know something and sort of move the smoke over you know your body and depending on what it was hallucin is hallucinogenic and that's what tobacco yeah. was you know that's what the native tobacco which we call nicotina rustica we we're smoking varieties of nicotinum tobacco Nicotina rustica is hardly used. That's what mainly the indigenous tribes were using. Smaller leaves. They think it was wildly grown, but these leaves have 8 to 10% nicotine content. Ooh. So literally, one time I smoked it, it was in Vietnam on a bus stop. I was using the restroom, and some gentlemen were smoking a bamboo water pipe. Didn't smell like anything funny. It smelled yeah. like tobacco. I tried it and literally almost fell down because it's, it just gives you such a rush. So this was being used in ceremonial practice to communicate with the spirit world. So that you understand 8 to 10% nicotine content where we're looking at 1 to 3% of a cigar of nicotine content. Uh, cigarettes way in, in t to the top, but um, you know, there'll be a lot of times people say you are um, smoking cigars because you have to, because you, uh, you need that nicotine. It's, you're hardly getting it. You know, a tomato is 5% nicotine, where a, a premium cigar could be one to three. Yeah. yeah, so you can imagine... Uh, Let's try 10. You can imagine the head rush yeah. that, that would come from that. So, you know, at the time, you know, when tobacco was so-called discovered, I think some of the lighter tobaccos were in the Caribbean area. So when you come up to, you know, the 1600s, and then Connecticut was found 1633. You had a lot of tra uh, trading between Jamestown. Of course, tobacco pretty much saved, you know, Jamestown. Yeah. And uh, it was desolate. Everybody was starving. And then that crop really saved the parish. And then it started trading up north. And in 1630, uh, 1613, a Dutch explorer found Connecticut. His name was Adrian Block. If you know, Block yeah, Island is sure. named after him. So the Dutch were uh, very much interested in trading furs and whatnot. He found the Connecticut River, went up to the Connecticut River all the way to Hartford, and that's when Hartford was established. But of course, along the way, tobacco was very much a part of the indigenous culture, and it was discovered then. Within five years, you know, people started actually growing tobacco on their homesteads. Yeah, and using. And that's how perfect. that's how tobacco was consumed back then. They they had it. They everybody was growing tobacco, and you'd kind of make your cigars or or smoke it in a pipe. That that was what people don't realize. Mainly in the North American tribes, it was mainly a pipe culture. Um, you had more of the cigar culture down in Central America and the Caribbean, but a lot of it at that time in the 1600s, mid-1600s, was uh, chew and also for pipes. And then you come into a gentleman by the name of uh, Mr. Putman. He was a Revolutionary War um, captain who um, had a fight in Cuba there, and he is said to really make cigar smoking more popular in Connecticut. So it was said that he brought up a lot of Cuban cigars, and then you have a seed trade happening between Virginia, uh, Cuba, 
and then Connecticut. Of all places. It seems so weird because we live up this way, but that's where you were born and brought up, and your family has roots to it, and it's what Connecticut is all about. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Connecticut. My family's Italian, um, so no, they, they weren't growing, but again... Um, they were smoking it. They were smoking it. I actually went to high school with one of the grandsons of F.D. Grave ah, okay. and son. So. All right, so that, when you were talking about Connecticut cigars. F.D. Grave is a perfect example. There's Topper and there's Moneymaker and there's the, these cigar brands that... Topstone. Yeah, one Topstone. Of them, yeah. So you as a young smoker, when you started out smoking, these are the cigar yeah. brands. It was for me too. Topstone Extra Oscuro yeah. is one of my you know, yeah. grandfather's staples. You know, at that time, Topper, of course. And, and when Connecticut Broadleaf on premium cigars became very popular and stuff, this is what the flavor would bring me back to those low price cigars and we did it once before in the care package that we gave away a, a topper cigar which is a low price cigar and people said what's up with this and we did a show on it and people said oh my god as, as you smoke it well this is what some of these companies are looking for this it's such a case. unique flavor yeah it's that connecticut broadleaf that was sort of the inspiration for my charter oak brand yeah it was always to pay homage to those brands uh from connecticut i wanted to make a value brands that we used yeah. we would sell truckloads of it i mean that's yeah. when when we started out in business that's what people smoked yeah. and then it became higher end and higher end as it went on but we actually just got uh, number one best value cigar of the year for charter oak uh, cigar aficionado this and, last and month. you guys got the number three cigar of all wow yeah big honor i've been reading cigar aficionado since its onset so uh, as i look on that you beat out Fuente, you beat out Padron, you beat out Cuban cigars, and all Which I can I'm say big is fans of both companies. Yeah, yeah. all I can yeah. say is congratulations because as a, uh, but you know, a lot of people looking at your brands and stuff say here's a young cigar maker, and um, he is a young man. But the thing is, he has so many years in the business. He's one of the guys I can talk about in the old days because you, as a teenager, was into this. I try not to talk about it too much because of all this FDA stuff, yeah. but 18, I started in the business. Yeah. yeah. 18, uh, started running a shop in Connecticut called the Calabash Shop. Unbelievable. I was going to school studying international business, and when I wasn't in class, I was running the shop. So I just fell in love with, I've, um, if you see, you know, what I work on as far as brands, culture, history, I, I've always been in love with the human story, you know, and going back in time and seeing how we got to this point. Um, so cigar smoking was, you know, always fascinating to me, this modern day ceremony that we're all, yeah. all still taking part, it's, part it's of. It's a wonderful industry if you love history and you love the cigar industry. You get to put both of them together, be creative at the same time, and how's that huh? that's that's been great yeah. you know to use the boxes and the bands as a canvas for yeah. that has been and that's sort of how <coughs> foundation has evolved and, and come about and I, uh, I remember when the El Wednesday came out and I'm scratching my head of trying to pronounce it and what's the story you came <laughs> you came in you gave me a beautiful mask that I have yeah. of it and explained to me the story behind it and it leads to a story which is great for the consumer anyway sure. is the story behind what this is and uh, because it's it's a historical product Cigars, it, never mind tobacco. You go deep into tobacco in, in Connecticut, it's just a... It's still a, alive. Yeah. It's still alive and, and rich today, yeah. And you took it all the way to say, okay, let me even put my office there. Had to do it. Yeah. Had to do it. But, there and, was no other way. And, and nobody else is doing that. No, you know, Florida is a lot more attractive as far as taxes yeah. and, and whatnot. Um, so we actually ship out of out of Florida, but our offices are, are right in the Connecticut yeah. Valley. So. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Is the is the Connecticut Valley in jeopardy as far as the value of the real estate growing tobacco versus putting up a Walmart? Yeah, so you know, in the 50s and 60s, that re the suburbanization really started. So you started to see um, a decline of the amount of acreage, and a lot of it selling out to properties. Now you have, you know, up the street from us is a Amazon fulfillment center, a million square feet. Um, you have yeah, UPS crazy. there, and so a lot of it has decreased. But now you have a lot of protection amongst certain areas, so you have land that's farming land that's marked for another hundred years so it's protected but then you have those other pieces of property which are definitely more valuable especially if you can build up yes you know so there's definitely um been a decline but i think what we have now is is pretty stable and as we'll get to you know connecticut broadleaf is in really great demand right now 
you just coming back from Nicaragua, yeah. and, and you lived there for many, many years. Quite the opposite where you go to Connecticut. You, you go to Nicaragua where they're, uh, never mind where the factories are, where they're making the cigars, but you go where the farms are, and there's villages, and there's people live, and they work the farm, and that's it. And you go to Connecticut where the farms are, and there's the fulfillment center with millions <laughs> of things. There's a Walmart there. There's all kinds of stores, hustle and bustle, and you're driving past some of these, not even realizing this is tobacco farming industry here, and here is Amazon, and here is Walmart, and it was all tobacco fields. Yeah, it was. Point. You know, you're talking at the height, 35,000 acres, especially in that Windsor area. They call it the Windsor soil. Yeah. It was just some of the richest, best, best soil. Is so that why Connecticut Broadleaf is in such high demand? Because those farming fields have been diminished? That that also over the years, but it's there's been a you can't replicate this seed variety anywhere else. Whereas the shade seed variety has been replicated in Ecuador, sure, because of the cloud. And even cover. now in Honduras, and in Honduras, people are experimenting. But the Connecticut broadleaf, you can't replicate replicate that river valley and the the broadleaf seed is just has that sweetness yeah, yeah they can move the natural, seed but they can't plant that somewhere else and get that you don't have that 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 yeah. same soil and that's what's interesting about it being in connecticut you have the glacier soil where mainly these other areas that grow tobacco nicaragua the land of lakes and volcanoes most active volcanoes in central america mainly volcanic soil which is also amazing and creates the right microclimate for growing cigar tobaccos. So again, the glacier soil you can't replicate anywhere. Can't replicate that river. So, so it's seed, it's climate, and then it's actually what's in that soil that matters. It's a big, big part of, of what ends up happening there. Um, you try to incorporate some Connecticut in everything you do? You know, in in you know Charter Oak yeah. definitely uh, Tabernacle definitely you know the Upsetters also uses Connecticut Broadleaf our infused brand yeah. which is interesting um, and there's a story there also between the Jamaica, uh, Jamaica Connecticut connection which is interesting right um, that all formed right after uh, World War II um, in World War II everybody was off at war so Connecticut went to the Caribbean and Jamaica to get workers. And Hartford, Connecticut has the third largest population of Jamaicans in the United States. I, I remember because of this yeah, region back yeah. in the day um, with um, Culbro. Uh, Culbro, yeah. yeah. Um, um, Cullman would bring in Jamaicans because their Macanudo brand was Jamaica, and they would bring them in and house them there, and exactly. they would live in live in the dorms, basically. There's still or barracks. Yeah, yeah still they still Jamaican workers. Yeah, yeah. yeah unbelievable, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. So, so uh, I'm skipping around, but uh, no, that's all right. Yeah. I want to take a break, and when we come back, uh, those that don't know, know Nick, uh, a, a new young brand owner, he has over 20 years in the cigar industry. Uh, we'll not go back in history with Nick's, but uh, uh, of his history, but go to the the present and future of the company of Foundation. Uh, we're live at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, and you're listening to the Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. There was a time when cigars were the hallmark of elegance and success. In this time gone by, the aficionado would revel in opening a beautiful box, only to find their favorite celebratory smoke emblazoned with a heritage-laden band. It's time to put the bundle down and travel back to this golden age. For your voyage, may we humbly suggest the only cigar worthy of being packaged in a handmade marble box. Berlin Wall Series from Hammer and Sickle. Live well. Romeo San Andreas by Romeo y Julieta. The Romeo y Julieta love story with a bold and modern twist. America's favorite love story takes on a modern zeal with this A.J. Fernandez collaboration. Romeo San Andreas by Romeo y Julieta, crafted in Esteli, Nicaragua, is a contemporary take on the rich and robust profile of the Romeo by Romeo collection. This exceptional premium offering employs an aged San Andreas wrapper, considered one of the most flavorful leaves used in today's premium cigar market. Handcrafted in Nicaragua by cigar master A.J. Fernandez, full flavored, dressed in a stunning San Andreas wrapper, rich and bold profile with notes of dark chocolate, spice, and licorice, and available in four sizes, Robusto, Toro, Pyramid, and Short Magnum. Competitively priced under $10. Romeo San Andreas by Romeo y Julieta. 
the Romeo y Julieta love story with a bold and modern twist. It's an exquisite day here at the Jensen Estate patio overlooking the 13th green. And we're underway. Jim Jensen has chosen his favorite stick. The Diamond Crown Number no. 4 by J.C. Newman. See the way he holds the cigar, Tom? Mm. Excellent balance and heft. Ooh, he's eyeing the silky Connecticut Shade Wrapper. Fermented twice for the smoothest, richest flavor. And hand-rolled by the Fuente family with a blend of six to seven distinct Dominican and Caribbean basin tobacco leaves. Each lovingly aged for at least five years. Oh, now Jensen's lighting up the Diamond Crown. He's got a precision burn, Tom. Mm, Those highly complex flavors with hints of dark chocolate really deliver, Bill. Yes, like all cigars in J.C. Newman's premium diamond crown line. That'd be the highly rated Maximus and the Julius Caesar. Ah, now Jensen's settling in, rolling the rich smoke through his nose. Look at the satisfaction on his face, Bill. Oh, a thing of beauty, Tom. Experience the premium diamond crown brand by J.C. Newman at select retailers or diamond crown lounge near you. Find us on Facebook at J.C. Newman Cigar Co. or visit at diamondcrown.com. I want to talk to you today about my friend Glenn Case from Christoph Cigars. I've known him for many years. Glenn is a very nice guy, one of the nicest guys in the industry. Always friendly, always happy. So when I heard his brand Christoph was pissed off, I was surprised. Christoph Cigars have always been known as smooth and rich, and the pissed off Christoph is just that. But there's something else happening here. A natural San Andreas wrapper, the binder, Indonesian, and the filler, Nicaraguan. And like Glenn Case, the cigar starts off sweet, but then it gets pissed off. And like Bruce Banner, you don't want to piss off Glenn Case about Kristoff cigars. Or do you? Expect some spins and a nicotine kick. Strap yourself in for a ride. Pissed off Kristoff is deceivingly strong. You've been warned. Sold in 10 count boxes, four sizes including Churchill, 6x60, Robusto, and Corona Gorda. The hottest new brand is the Pissed Off Kristoff. Take it for a ride. Since 1964, Padron Cigars have had the same mission. With over 50 years spent to create a perfect cigar and more than 100 years to create a perfect legacy, the Padron family understands the significance of time. Padron delivers only the finest handmade complex cigars with the flavor of the Cuban heritage, out of which the Padron recipe was born. The Padron mission is simple, exceptional quality of their cigars and not the quality Quantity produced as a vertically integrated family owned company. Personal attention to every detail is taken in all steps of the tobacco growing and cigar making process. Padron Cigars, they give you, the cigar smoker, the confidence that each cigar is the same. Perfect. Padron Cigars, handcrafted since 1964. I want to tell you about my friend Hochi Blanco, a fourth generation Dominican cigar maker known for growing tobacco and producing highly acclaimed cigars for other people. As some things stay the same, other things have to change. Finally, Hochi's factory, Tobacalera Palmer, has produced the cigar that not only belongs to the factory, but pays homage to the cigar rolling room known as La Galera. The La Galera Connecticut blend is special, using an Ecuadorian Connecticut wrapper surrounding a Dominican blend of Peloto Cubano, Criollo 98, and a varietal that Hochi named T112. With the exception of the wrapper, Hochi grows all of the La Galera tobaccos himself and carefully watches over every step. The flavor, smooth, but still offering plenty of flavor in all sizes, paying homage to the people and tools used in the factory. Now for the amazing part. La Galera Connecticut has a suggested retail price ranging from $4.95 to $6 and has been awarded the Cigar of the Year by the Cigar Authority. La Galera Connecticut, creating their own version of the Connecticut cigar because they demand more. This is Omar de Frias from Fratello Cigars and you're listening to the Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. And we're back with Nick Melillo from Foundation Cigars, and we're smoking his latest blend. It's called the Tabernacle Havana Seed Connecticut Number no. 142. It just rolls off the tongue. 
No problem, right? You remember it's that? because you already used El Wawense. You yeah, couldn't I know, use that one. I know. You know, I didn't want to have any trade, trade uh, mark conflicts. There we go. With yourself. Yes. And number 142. So look for that. It's very small for us older guys. The, the type is, uh, I'd say, like a six. Uh, it's so small on there, but it's 142. It's a six. It's a six. <laughs> it's very small. It is too small. Too small. You got to think of the, us old guys that like cigars, I know, too. I know. But although you, uh, those that are watching, uh, he is wearing uh, shades in, indoors because he's too cool for the room. No, I, and I know when I wear the shades, that's what comes across. But yeah. I really do have a, a problem with light sometimes that triggers yeah. migraines. So, All right. Yes. Yeah. It's bright up here. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. So it's not. See, yeah. my man back there has the same issue. There we go. So he knows I'm not BS. All right. Um, your first line, as you mentioned, El Wawense. And I can say it now, and I was so psyched, and then he came out with the Maduro version, and he called it the, the wise man, man Maduro, which was, that's what El he Wawense was so means. Pissed. He was so pissed. Because I spent about because a year it getting it. it took him the year to figure out how to say El Wawense, and he's like, why didn't he just call the first one wise man? I could have saved myself a year of pronunciation. That was the plan. I, I was trying to frustrate him. I tried yeah. to give him a hard time. So It, it worked. It, it worked. But uh, listen, I know a word in Spanish, El Wawense. And it's not even a Spanish word. That's why Spanish, people that speak Spanish have a difficult time yeah. with it. Uh, it's an indigenous word to Nicaragua, Nahuatl word, which uh. means the wise man. Oh, so. so somebody in another country that speaks Spanish. Oh, they have no idea. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. there's a small group of people, little, most of them are gone now, and they understand what this word is. <laughs> yeah. So you, so you, you, know, you play, this is your company, you do whatever you want with that's it. That's what, the yeah. plan was to do it this way. Obviously, I knew there would be a difficult uh, word to pronounce for you know the US market but for me living in Nicaragua for so long it was important as my first brand not only for it to be an all Nicaraguan blend but also to pay homage to Nicaraguan culture and history in this place I've called my home for the past yeah. you know 15 years so Wei Wense is the oldest indigenous satire of the Western Hemisphere it's actually protected by UNESCO it's a, as a cultural treasure they protect the pyramids they protect Wei Wednesday. Okay. So, uh, you know, I really felt it was important to, to bring that to the market. And then, obviously, I knew, you know, the wise man would be a better uh, direction to go. Yeah. So, are people calling El Wense the wise man natural or anything? You know, like you that? get to go with whatever the feeling. Yeah, you know, just do if whatever you want. You want. To learn a new word, yeah. you, you, know, you, you can learn Wei, Wei Wense. And uh, if not, the wise man suits you, you go with that. But that's your baby. That's your first one that's my that baby. you own, yeah. El Wense. Yeah. Um, after coming off of the company you worked for before, which is um, Drew Estates, and having the success that Liga Pavada was, and now time has passed, yes, you're going to come out with your first product, El Wense. Yes. What an act to follow, though. Definitely. Some people look Definitely. at it as, oh, he's going to live off the reputation of this other thing. I thought quite the opposite is going to happen. You have the, the hottest cigar at that time that was out there, and then you're coming out with something else. And every, you know, I'm, uh, how are you going to beat this? This thing was the hottest cigar you out there. You yeah. didn't try to beat it. You just did what you... Well, you did something you did different. What you I wanted do. to do something because I'd never done an all-Nicaraguan blend. Um, so I got the chance to work with um, Aganorsa Leaf, with Eduardo Fernandez, who I've known, you know, since 2003. And they grow one of the nicest Nicaraguan rappers that I know yeah. uh, in the north in Jalapa. And uh, brought on my art director, Alex Garcia. We know him as Thief Operandi from Esteli, who's been a good friend of mine, incredible artist. And uh, I knew if there was anyone to translate Wei Wense into an image, it would be him. So we worked really close with that. And I said, let me do an all Nicaraguan blend. I had the broadleaf you know, aging. It wasn't necessarily ready at that time. And I really, again, wanted wanted to really express my love for Nicaragua and this place that I've called my home. You know, I haven't been on the sales and distribution side of things until this past three years. Yeah. So um, it was a passion project for me. It was definitely, um, you know, again, I could have easily called it something different, but I wanted this word to be yeah. exposed and I wanted to do a blend I never had worked on before. Yeah. Um, business so. wise, I, you know, as a business person, I looked at it when I came out and I said, wow, He's going nuts. in a totally, yeah, yeah, going a totally different direction or whatever. Yeah. And uh, the thing catches on. And then when you came out with the Maduro version of it, uh, totally different look, 
to yes. the to the cigar itself sure, and sure. pressed and um, you know simple box uh, right. you know not the dr- full dress box yeah. like the Cuban style yeah but uh, I think and you, you know the numbers better than I do I think it was even more popular than the first yeah, it, uh, to me anyways it eclipsed the the Wawense. yeah they go hand in hand but it's great because people discover one and then they discover the other yeah. one so you have the Wawense with the Corojo wrapper and then the Wise Man Maduro uh, which we got the number three uh, cigar of the year for yeah. has a San Andreas Mexican uh, wrapper on it, which I'm very involved in yeah. San Andreas growing behind the scenes and working with farmers. Um, so we actually developed a project uh, um, over the years in in Mexico to cure Mexican tobacco in Esteli, Nicaragua uh, with the Oliva family from yeah. Tampa. Because you have a uh, separate business that helps the farmers out. and Yeah, behind the scenes, I don't talk about it All too right. much, is, is um, you know, consulting and, and helping farmers and getting them connected with the distribution and fermentation. Because yeah. you have these different areas, you know, farming is one thing, sorting, fermentation is a whole nother yeah. world. Then you have the production yeah. and manufacturing and then the sales side. So all farmers don't know how to, to ferment and sort tobacco. And we call that pre-industry, right? Pre-industry, correct. So it is a missed opportunity to a lot of farmers that are out there that if they do that wrong, they got beautiful tobacco and they didn't do this. Every step has to be done properly. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Temperature, humidity, yeah. all the way down to seed. And, and, and they'll get the more smell. value of their product if they do that right. Exactly. And they're focused on that farming, you know, the farming aspect of it. So to know the sales and distribution side of tobacco is a whole nother, nother world. So you want to keep people that do what they do best and keep them focused sure. on that. And uh, so that's what I do is, yeah. is link people together. You A uh, shout out to John Hart. He has a new rep here in New England. John Hart. Happy yeah. to have him in Nick Goss. In I'm happy to have him back in the industry yeah. because he's been out for a few years and he was a guy there at where you were back at the old old corral. John Hart I met in Honduras in 2001 on the Camacho That's trip. It. And you as a consumer and him as a somebody working I was store? working for a shop. Oh, you working for we a shop were both too. working for shops wow. at the time. And then um, I didn't see him fast forward until maybe 2008. And I came up from Nicaragua, and we were doing a uh, an outdoor in the summertime, like a, a grill out. And somebody invited me, and uh, he was there as a rep. And I had a box of Liga Pravadas, and he didn't have any because they were impossible to get at yeah. that time. And he looks at me, and he goes, "How the hell did you get that? Who the hell are you to get?" Th-? And then he looks at me again, Nick Molillo. Wow. And we hadn't seen each other since Honduras 2001. Well, so to have him on board is uh, exciting. So he came up last week and he said, come on, let's have a cigar. I'm back in the industry. And he gives me an El Wawense, which I probably haven't had close to a year that sure. I haven't smoked that. The new stuff as it's coming in. That's what I'm smoking. Right. And I smoked that and I said, wow, you got to go back to yes. El Wawense. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the, the roots. spices, the spices that came out. And I said, oh, my God, and we got to start doing that. We, you know, because we're always looking ahead, right? Sure. But there's such great cigars out there. Yeah. And go back to that. It's not always about what's new. It's about what's good. Right. And they're right. just getting better and better. Uh, El Wawense Maduro, I actually even like it better than the regular one. Apparently, so does Cigar Aficionado. Uh, to give you number three. Um, and uh, go ahead, Jonathan. I know you're going to ask the question. They got a 95. Originally a 93 and then a 95. Oh, I know it. <laughs> oh, good God. How, uh, how quickly did you get hit up for advertising yeah. after that? <laughs> no comment. Not, not that quickly. I will be at the uh, Big Smoke in Miami. Yeah. Yes, you That's going to be my first Big Smoke. I uh, haven't been because I've always been in Nicaragua, and uh, yeah, I'm looking I, I forward want, to that. And I want to give credit where credit is due because they get a bad rap of they're only taking care of advertisers and things like that. You're not an advertiser. I haven't advertised, haven't spent the dollar with those guys and since the launch of the company they've always you know launched I mean, they've just been great. Right. And, um, yeah, you know, Cigar Aficionado, for me, again, it, it, it's the roots of Absolutely. the industry that we're in. You know, being the in Bible, the 80s. man, and, that was uh, it. It took you from, you know, your dad, your great-grandpa smoking cigars and opened it up to yeah. a, a wider range and audience during the 90s and really was the onset of the cigar boom. Yeah. So, so um, were you surprised? I was surprised because I don't put a no lot heads of... heads up. 
No heads no. up? No, not at all. I mean, I knew it got a good rating during during the Dude. year. It got a 93, right. and I, I knew they smoked him and rated him again before they did the top 25. Elway Wednesday got top 25, the Corojo, in 2016. Um, so I don't. I try not to put too much weight into expectations and ratings, you know, in general, because everybody's got a different palate sure you know and it's about your your own experience best cigar in the world is the one you you enjoy i can't tell other people what they should no. enjoy or what they like Listen, everybody that, that's going to help your sales staff it's going to move the needle it's going to give some attention to something that deserves some attention and it's great because it does open to a wider audience you know a lot of cigar smokers as you know they don't necessarily get into you know the the blogs per right. se or the nitty-gritty the of the industry of it, yeah. And um, I, I think there is a few different type of cigar smokers, and they're speaking to the person that smokes a cigar every once in a while, not a real cigar geek, is, you know, because you, how much are you going to tell how to cut and light a cigar to yeah. somebody that's been around for a long time? And, and it's, t you know, again, there's so many good cigars out there <coughs> on the market, and it's, again, everybody's, you know, own perception of what, and they have this platform that is, you know, they've been working on for many, many years. And, you know, it's great, Marvin Schenken is from. New Haven, Connecticut. Um, yeah. So he's Connecticut, Connecticut, Connecticut guy. Dave Savono yep. also. So um, good. It's nice to be, you know, recognized and and they recognize my passion for Connecticut and, you know, cigars. So um, the next brand I want to talk about is a value cigar brand you put out that also gets a lot of attention from them as a best value. Just got number one best value. Yeah. Unbelievable Charter Oak. If you've never had that, it comes in natural and Maduro. It's something that uh, we had a hard time actually keeping stock for a while there. Yeah, we've been that you know popular. We've been that popular um you know small company and been growing uh, leaps and bounds so uh we're caught up now but charter oak was that everyday cigar that i wanted to create for you know cutting the lawn or yeah. doing some work and really pay homage to those cigars that all my grandfather smoked so charter oak is the would you say that the charter oak connecticut is your grandfather's connecticut <laughs> Or I, I, that's a great line. I think I might use start using yeah. that. It would. He would go with the Maduro broadleaf, though. Fair enough. Um, Fair enough. I would actually say my other grandfather would go with the Connecticut. If you use that line, I get royalties. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, All right. Maybe we're, I guess I can't hide from it now. We're on. We're on video. Uh, but yeah. So Charter Oak, symbol of Hartford, Connecticut, was an old oak tree. Actually, hid a charter in it to hide it from the British. And uh, there's nothing I think more that really symbolizes Connecticut um, as a state. Of course, it's on the quarter and the coin and the state capital, so it was perfect um, to really express that that love for Connecticut and its tobacco. So highest volume product you have? Definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah, I, I mean, volume so. is definitely more of a volume. Um, yeah. I definitely take a uh, you know trim my margins too to keep a good price point on that cigar. And, yeah. And we haven't... How dare I say it, but I'm going to say it. It's underpriced cigar. If there's an underpriced yeah. cigar out there, Charter Oak's the underpriced. Unfortunately, probably second quarter prices are going to uh, have to see? go. But this he is... Was, he was going to do it anyway. This is mainly because of the FDA. We sure. haven't we haven't adjusted any pricing for three years based yeah. on our FDA. You no, know, uh, Chuck and, Berry smokes Charter and Oak. This, yeah? I didn't know if you know that. But, oh, uh, good old Chuck Berry. Yo! <laughs> good, good to see you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Great cigar. Great yeah. cigar. Uh, then a mellow cigar right up my wheelhouse as far as flavor goes. Something with, with a big history. High Clare Castle. High Clare Castle. Very surreal project. And I don't think people realize how organic this project came to be. Good friend of mine, Adam Von Gutkin, who I met actually through a shop in Connecticut, um, him and his wife became friends with La Lady Carnarvon and Lord Carnarvon from High Clear Castle. I had the pleasure of you introducing me to them. Wow. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, being a history lover, his great grandfather discovered King Tut's tomb. But the history of cigar smoking in this castle, you know, of course, once I, I heard about this, you know, just intrigued me right away they had been working on a gin because my friend adam owns a distillery moon moonshine onyx moonshine in connecticut so they had been working on a gin high high clear castle gin which is actually about to be released in the next 60 60 to 70 days globally um and in the process of developing that gin adam said cigars came up 
Adam said, you got to meet Nicholas. He lives in Nicaragua, and I ended up meeting Lord Carnarvon. He came down to Nicaragua, wow. and uh, we worked on an amazing blend. Uh, so very he good. He took this serious enough oh. to come down there and actually work it and say, not just put my name on the thing. This thing has amazing. to be right. Amazing. Amazing. Amazing human being, his family, his wife. I had the pleasure of going out there in June because we launched the product in England, and we had an amazing event at the castle. Very humble very down to earth and that's what made me want to do the project yeah i try to surround myself with good people i don't sure. you know money or, or things like this don't really concern me but he is just a, a gentleman and so down to earth he's the godson to the queen of england yeah for the love of god yeah right. you know uh, i mean <laughs> and, he, and he's your friend now <laughs> and he's a friend yeah. and i consider him you know a good friend and How? adam is has been amazing and we just formed this partnership that is you know people don't believe it they think it's kind of like a more of a gimmick on downton abbey where the you know they yeah, film right. high you know at high clare castle which yeah, the well, movie's coming out next year or some sort of license agreement just give me a dollar no, for every cigar no, we, we, this is serious we we formed a a, a whole partnership how much of a project. role did he play play on what ended up becoming the final blend so very much uh, a part of not the actual blending process sure. of course he, he entrusted me to that but when he came down to Nicaragua and we actually all blindfolded smoked these different blends we actually no joke and not for the story all chose the same exact blend so what I was really trying to do was mimic cigars around that time of the 20s I got access to the archives at the castle of course they have you know historians and if you go to highclaircastlecigar.com you can see some of these documents that I had access to you know of course a lot of Cuban cigars at the time Partagas um, so I really that was the inspiration for me blend wise and for developing the line so really amazing amazing project and it just fit with the rest of foundation you know the brands of culture and history and it's just an honor to be able to work on that project do you consider yourself uh, or are you a real blender you sit down with the tobaccos and say okay this is going to work with this and it's going to work with this that's Most you. Most definitely, yes. That's what he did. That yeah, was his job. Yeah. That's what I technically there's, call blending. There's so many people that call themselves blenders, and that's not what they do. They have someone like you do it, and, and then they and adjust pick accordingly. this, yeah. I, I like I've, this blend. I've been fortunate to have the experience of, you know, a lot of guys ask me, how can I become a blender? I want to become... You got to move to Nicaragua. Right. You got to become intimate with this leaf. I was fortunate to learn from a lot of these Cuban masters that left Cuba in the 60s. And now we're in, in Nicaragua. And I was 24 when I moved to Nicaragua. So when I started learning where all of these flavor profiles were coming from, from cigars that I loved at the time, you know, that's when it all started to click and come together. And then when I started being able to work with Broadleaf, you know, then it really, that was always my dream. So, you know, to learn these different tobaccos, and there's so many great tobaccos out there. There's not necessarily one that's better than the other. It's different characteristics. Yeah, and how, how do, do they you put play those off together? Of each other? Yeah. You put me in a kitchen, you know, I'd be a disaster with some of the best ingredients. Um, you know, I've just, I jumped in the deep end in 2003 and had to learn how to swim. And I was just passionate about it. And I still am. And, and But you were always the guy in the background. Um, you weren't the front man at all. Um, Drew Estate did not use you at all as a front man at all. No. You're the back end. Then you had to come out from behind the curtain. And now you're kind of a front man to your own company. Yes, yes. You know, and I understand why at that time. Because now as I get into both right. sides of the industry, yeah. you know, and that's why I, I do spend a lot of time in Nicaragua. There's a great demand for me to be in the store and to be doing events. But I always tell, you know, my customers and my sales team, awesome. this is especially because production's being increased. That is always my number one commitment it's gotta is be the to end, the quality, the end, the end product, to making sure I, I'm a cigar smoker. Yeah. So I know what it's like when you get a cigar that's that's not great or it's yeah. off or the draw and of course it's a handmade product it's going to happen from time to time but i'm trying to keep that yeah. you know as as low percentage as possible and i've had the the uh pleasure of 
you know, when I left in 2014, it was the largest factory in Nicaragua. Right. So, started out of, you know, a bunch Perdomo's of things. old house. Yeah. And uh, so, you, you know. You were there from the beginning of that? From, so, in 2003, we were working out of uh, Nick's old, Nick Perdomo's wow. old house in the center of Esteli. Yeah. And, um, you know, he had just moved into his factory. Yeah. And, you know, it was an apartment upstairs. The back of the house was kicked out for a, a production floor. And uh, I, I yeah. was I was on the outside of that building. I stayed at Nick's next door. Yeah, sure. In the back of it, how little that was, and uh, round the clock. I mean, at yeah. nighttime they were working in there, and craziest. Yeah, it, it, you got to give them all. Well, everybody that had anything to do with that of sure. starting from nothing, uh, started from the bottom. Wow. Yeah. So uh, incredible journey brings us to the tobacco that has probably the greatest name of all the tobaccos that you work with, the Jamaican cow's tongue. Yes. Yeah, the indigenous you don't taste to Jamaica. It, it tastes you. You know, it's a very smooth, very a mild, creamy tobacco. Again, when I started smoking cigars in uh, 96, a lot of cigars were being made in Kingston, Jamaica, at the uh, C. Fuentes factory. Sure. Of course, there was, you know, Hyde Park in 1995, yeah. no cellophane, uh, made in Kingston, incredible cigars. Um, so I fell in love at the same time, you know, when I was falling in love with cigars, I was falling in love with reggae music, sure. with rock steady, with ska music from the, the mid 60s, you know, early 70s. So about three, four years ago, I ended up, I was working on Way Wednesday and said, I need a break. I'm, uh, I'm stressing out here. So I took a trip from Nicaragua and flew in February 5th to Kingston, Jamaica for Bob Marley's 70th birthday. And, uh, that night, I just showed up at his house. There was a big party, which I was welcomed into. Wow. And uh, at the end of the night... By I yourself? I went by myself. Wow. Yeah. I met some friends there. Uh, got to hang out with some of Bob Marley's kids. Um, and uh, I started seeing tobacco leaves from people's pants. And uh, they were bringing them out. Of course, they were smoking some of that lyrical Chiba Chiba from right. time to time. But um, I said, you know, where did you get this tobacco? And it turns out there's still, you know, cow tongue tobacco being grown on the island. So I said, this would be perfect um, to use in a cigar. It's perfect for an infused cigar. I definitely wanted to come out with something for all the infused cigar lovers. And uh, we ended up making the Upsetters, which was Bob Marley's first backing band um, in the late 60s. And then it turned into, he was a studio producer called Lee Scratch Perry. So at this time also, Jamaica was very obsessed with uh, spaghetti westerns from Italy in the late 60s. So if you look at all the album covers from this period, they're all a play on spaghetti westerns. Oh, wow. The good, the bad, and the upsetters. So the upsetters really evolved out of that. And oh. then, of course, you have the classic red, gold, and green. Um, so I wanted to make something that wasn't heavily inf a good balance between the the natural tobaccos, the cow tongue, and the infusion. Not to be all you know heavily sweet on the palette but do a nice balance between between the two and i think we uh it's the it really it. is the only one that i and and, and i I typically smoke it. I get here at 8 o'clock in the morning if I'm going to have one. And I smoke it before anyone gets here because I don't want people to see me doing it. But <laughs> it is, you can taste the tobacco. Yeah. It, you definitely, there's infusion and, and most of that happens in the aroma. But flavor-wise, it yeah. tastes like a cigar. Exactly. And I that was that. And that was the goal. And we brought on uh, Rick Ardito, mm. who's been a good friend of mine uh, since back in 97. The two of you. Yeah. The two of you together. Yes. The, the only the only way to really round that trifecta out would be maybe to get Phil Zangi involved. But the three of you together, I don't think I'd want to even be around it. It'd be combustion. It, it's a fun time. Let me tell you, especially when we're in the stores together. And, you know, Rick's just got a, uh, such a passion for the industry and, you know, the Upsetters brand. And he was out of the industry for a long time. Yeah. And, um you know, I These said, guys only come back if it's you. You know, it's great. It's yeah. an honor, and it's you know, it's an honor to work with them. And uh, you know, a lot of them we had worked together, but really not because I was always in Nicaragua. But we always had this friendship. Yeah. And uh, I definitely needed a lot of help on the sales and distribution side. So to have Rick come on board and be involved is an honor. Same with you know John Hart. Yeah. Is to have him. He's been out for a couple yeah, of years. Yeah. Have your back. I, I man. think as it as the industry goes corporate and it becomes numbers and things like that. The passion 
you know, you can see passion being pushed to the side, and they want back into passion. That's why they got into it. So they go to a passionate company, which is yours, and say, "Okay, this is where this is where I wanted cigars to be." They know I. They they can see it. I think yeah. the love for the for the leaf yeah. and and the industry, and I think. Um, that authenticity it really translates yeah. and we hope it translates to of course the final consumers and they they see what we're we're all about all right so let's get to the pipeline new stuff coming out you're gonna have you're gonna something up your sleeve that you can talk about you know ipcpr maybe you June-ish. know uh, you're gonna see some line extensions uh probably a lancero in the havana scene oh, oh okay great. you guys don't like lanceros <laughs> nobody um, does nobody does you know, Sullivan, there's Joe. yeah there's a potential you're gonna see and this is the first time i'm saying it is uh the event only cigar that i've been doing called the menelik which means son of the wise men uh you might be seeing that at the show all right and i'll say it here so it's in in writing all right you're gonna see another event cigar come out called the grasshopper grasshopper yes which until recently i learned is really the origin of the word cigar really comes for the, from the spanish word for grasshopper this is going to be a, this is going to be a candela there's definitely going to be some candela in it i'm working on the blends right now so i've never worked with candela with any except for uh one cigar in the upsetters that we have right. which is uh, sapo which means a uh, frog in uh in spanish um but a uh, traditional blend it's gonna in, have candela in it not on, on the it, wrapper i can't say much more man you're wearing this is why you're wearing a green more. shirt and your, your guy down there is wearing green pants I, i'm sure this is going to be you know on, on half wheel nobody listens to this oh yeah <laughs> nobody listens is the metal going to be packaged the same way it currently was for the for the event cigar and the, no. the brown packaging mm, it's going to be in a beautiful box and uh, you're going to see some uh, bronze heat pressed in it. Ah. And uh, again, my, my art director, uh, Thief Operandi, did some amazing artwork for the inside of the box. So you're not saying no to the <laughs> candela being in it as part of the blend, which no I don't know of anyone doing that. No comment. So, yes. Now you're really stretching it, man. <laughs> That's Candela happening. inside would be insane. Why would you do that? Why would you do show it? it? No, there's, it has a certain distinct flavor and, and a certain sweetness i could see that playing yeah <laughs> i could see it working <laughs> you're talking to the guy that hasn't seen the godfather right now. right i know <laughs> i don't know how credible this is yeah um, once um, you've seen the godfather you can make, determine that the if that's going to happen the grasshopper grasshopper the only snatch this pebble from yeah. my hand <laughs> yes the only cigar with yeah. candela in it yeah. so this word cigar cigarel cigaril was the the Spanish word for small garden. So when tobacco first came to Spain, you know, the aristocrats had tobacco in their gardens. You know, you were of the upper echelon, so to have exotic plants in your garden was a very in thing to do. Okay. So cigarril was something that was actually meant garden, but it also meant garden because of the grasshoppers that would chirp in these gardens. And through foreigners coming through, somehow that word got turned into cigar. You know, we always talk about use all your senses when smoking a cigar, and the one thing missing is sound. And the grasshopper made sounds. That's it. So it's, is there going to be any sound to the cigar? It's going to talk is to you. Gonna yeah, it's going to talk to your inner soul. Okay, it talks to your inner soul. That's all tobacco should. That's you, when you really yeah. start understanding tobacco. You know, and if you get more than five tobaccos in a cigar, you get electrical current. So you could run a speaker off of it. So true. <laughs> so true. <laughs> all right. So we got some information out there. Looking forward to some new stuff. Thank you, Nick Malolo. You certainly pleasure. can stay on the next hour if you'd like to stay with us. It would be my pleasure yeah. if you allow me to stay All on. All right, let's do that. When we come back, what's up in the cigar industry? What's coming up on the Cigar Authority? I have an offer I think uh, Mr. Jonathan Barry might take me up on today. I'm prepared for that. Am I prepared for that? We're live from the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, and you're listening to the Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. Stepping into the aging room has a new meaning at Aging Room Cigars, as Rafael Nodal has traveled to Spain, where the idea for Aging Room Solera was born. 
The Solera method of aging has been used for centuries in the making of wine, sherry, brandy, and rum. The method mixes different vintages, allowing them to age together. For Aging Room Solera, Raphael takes several tobacco vintages and puts them in bales, where they age together for another 12 to 18 months. This allows the tobaccos to marry for a longer period of time. At the end of the aging process, Aging Room Solera becomes a balanced and complex cigar with a fantastic price point. Aging Room Solera, it will have you calling for an encore. In a time where humidors are overflowing and retailers' shelves are on the verge of buckling, there is one brand that stands out amongst the rest. Sereno Cigar Company offers four distinct blends. The Connecticut, the Medio, Maduro, and Maduro XX, all aged to perfection. Crafted at the La Corona Cigar Factory in Esteli, Nicaragua, each artfully crafted blend comes to life by the experienced hands of master blender Omar Gonzalez Aleman and industry veteran Anthony Sereno. To create this masterpiece, a combination of hand-selected filler tobaccos from the fertile soils of Esteli and Jalapa are aged for over five years and then draped with a luxurious wrapper leaf to bring you an endlessly complex and majestic experience. A post-roll aging process of two additional years allows the blend to marry, creating unmistakable and ever-changing tasting notes that tantalize the palate, leaving you anticipating each and every drop. Visit SerenoCigars.com for a list of retailers, and you can always find Sereno Cigars available on Online at twoguyscigars.com. Sereno, a majestic cigar aged to perfection. You've heard us talking before about the best cigar magazine in the world, Cigar Journal. You want to know what makes Cigar Journal the best cigar magazine? Cigar Journal covers every angle of the cigar world, from exclusive stories and features, insightful interviews with industry power players, detailed cigar reviews, and of course, all the latest news and reports surrounding premium cigars. We're telling you, you will be impressed. Cigar Journal has stunning images, explanations, of Cigar Science Basics, this is the magazine for any cigar enthusiast, or better yet, passionado. Cigar Journal covers cigars in the U.S. and around the world and is printed right here in the USA. You owe it to yourself to discover the world's best cigar magazine, Cigar Journal. Available at your local cigar retailer and on the web at their new website, CigarJournal.com. That's CigarJournal.com. You're listening to The Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. Let me tell you a little bit about the Rocky Patel 15th Anniversary Cigar, or what they call the Three-Peat. Crafted in Rocky's boutique Nicaraguan factory, the 15th Anniversary was released in 2010 to commemorate Rocky Patel's 15th year in the cigar industry, and it impressed right out of the gate. The Robusto and the Torpedo both scored 93 points in Cigar Aficionado, while the Toro and Corona Gorda both notched 92 points. The Rocky Patel 15th Anniversary is a robust cigar with notes of toasted spice, roasted coffee, and almonds. Rocky Patel himself has referred to his 15th Anniversary as the Decade on Steroids. The 15th anniversary has also been named to Cigar Aficionado's Top 25 Cigars of the Year list on three separate occasions. Rocky's only brand to accomplish the three-peat. Rocky Patel's 15th anniversary. Rocky Patel's 15th anniversary. Rocky Patel's 15th anniversary. The La Galera Habano uses a classic wrapper on a staple cigar for a classy company. Hi there, this is David Garofalo of the Cigar Authority, and I want, no, no, I need to tell you about La Galera Habano. The La Galera Habano is an authentic cigar elaborated with the hands of the best cigar rollers of Tobacco Lera Palma in the Dominican Republic. Blended around an outstanding, flavorful Ecuadorian Habano wrapper, the Dominican-grown Corojo binder, and the filler made up of Peloto Cubano, Criollo 98, and Peloto de Oro, creating a medium to full-bodied, attractively consistent, and aromatic smoke that envies no other. I love this cigar. Have you tried La Galera Habano yet? Well, what are you waiting for? Available at Better Cigar Shops worldwide is La Galera Habano. The wait is over. La Galera Habano. Justo and his father Julio Eiroa 
are continuing the tradition of growing authentic Corojo and now bring you Aladino. Aladino is a true old-fashioned cigar, pure authentic Corojo grown in the Eiroa tobacco farms in Honduras from the original Cuban seed of Corojo. An Aladino cigar represents the golden era of cigars in Cuba, and after one light, this old-school smoke will bring you back. Aladino cigars come from JRE Tobacco, a family center company who manage all aspects of cigar growing and manufacturing. This crop to shop operation is fully committed to providing you with quality and satisfaction. The premier Corojo grower in the entire cigar industry is Julio Eiroa, a tobacco grower and master cigar blender who personally guarantees that Aladino will provide you the opportunity to enjoy the true authentic Corojo taste. Take this journey and be part of history in a cigar smoking experience like no other. Aladino. This is George Padron from Padron Cigars. You're listening to the Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. And we are back with our number two broadcasting live from the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. I got an offer I think Mr. Jonathan might accept, and I think Barry will too. Let's see. Welcome back, everybody, to the Cigar Authority. And, and Nick, you, uh, we got Nick Malillo here. You smoke other people's cigars? From time to time. From time to time. With you guys, I would uh, love right. to smoke a cigar. All right. Uh, I think you should. I think uh, especially blenders and stuff, see what's going on, what's happening, uh, and um, you know what's hot, what's not, and uh, what these other guys are putting out. Uh, this is a Honduran cigar, I believe, Barry. Tell us about this. Yep. Today's second cigar is the Aroa CBT, which is manufactured in Honduras by CLE Cigar Company. We're going to light up a 5x50 Robusto Honduran Puro, consisting of Maduro wrapper, binder, and filler from Honduras. It's part of the Cigar Authority Care Package. A single cigar will set you back $11.59, while a box of 20 is just $159.99, which is a savings of almost $27, or 11% off the box price at twoguyscigars.com. If you're too far away from a brick-and-mortar retailer that carries it, try twoguyscigars.com. That's the number two, guyscigars.com. So this is the Aroa CBT, meaning Kappa, Binder, and Trippa. Trippa means the filler? Filler, yeah. Filler? Yep. It's that's uh, Spanish for guts. Trippa. Oh, all right. Yeah, so the, the it, filler. And, yeah. that, and that's what you would call it in the factory, too? You say Trippa? Trippa. Yeah. yeah, Trippa. Okay. So now we know. Okay, let's give it a cut and light. It's time to cut our cigar. The official cutting brought to you by Perdomo Cigars. Perdomo is the brand, while all other brands were raising prices, Perdomo cut out the federal S-chip tax and actually lowered them. Perdomo Cigars, they stand for quality, tradition, and excellence. excellence. Speaking of excellence, Nick was nice enough to bring me a book that I can't wait to look through every single word of this, Tobacco Sheds of the Connecticut River Valley, which is nice great book. pitches and stuff out here. I'll just show it here. Just amazing, this barns. Yeah. That's what I do on my off time. I just take pictures of barns. Nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay with it. Or you just walk out your front door and look at one, right? Exactly. Okay. Let's give it right. a little dry taste. Do you, do you taste a cigar before you light it? I do. Yeah. 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 Definitely important. It's pretty clean. Dried apricots. Dried apricots. Has a little basement-y kind of... Umami thing going on. Basement-y. <laughs> little mildew? Like, like mildew? Three. Like a little mildew? Uh, I like the dried apricots. Like I don't want to say Damp page. and earthy. Basement-y umami. Well, the tobacco is earthy, right? Earthy. <laughs> Comes from the earth. <laughs> Should. All right. Are we lighting? Are we lighting? You lighting. We're going to light All our right. cigar today with the Vertigo Intimidator, featuring four jets, a color-changing flame, the patented Vertigo big-ass tank, a neck that bends, an easy adjustment at the bottom, all for the low price of twenty-four ninety-nine. That's the Vertigo Intimidator. That's a big ass tank right there. You're goddamn right it is. It's patented, you know. These colors are just—I mean, really. <laughs> really. You know, Twenty-five dollar lighter. It's awesome, right? Can we turn off the lights? You we uh, cannot. What's great about this is you're outside and it's bright, like it is today, and you don't lose the flame. Yeah, you can see where the flame is going. Yeah, so right. you don't burn your face off. Mm. Right? Don't want to do that. So maybe you can help me here. Uh, you know Skip Martin. I know Skip. Skip Martin. 
He uh, he he listens to the show every week. Uh, oh, Skip, Skip listening right now? He always listens. He, he typically he listens, listens on, on Sunday. Yeah, he listens, listens on Sunday. Oh, okay. and, then, and then live tweets Dave through <laughs> yeah. the uh, messenger okay. all the stuff that he got wrong. On Sunday. On Sunday. Gotcha. Yes. And uh, he's a fact checker. And apparently, I guess... Maybe last week, the week before, I think it was last week, right. we were talking about wages in Nicaragua as opposed to the Dominican Republic. It was last week because I came back from the Dominican mm-hmm. Republic, and my story was, what were they talking about in the Dominican Republic? Republic. What were they talking about? I'm not saying this is what I said. It was mm-hmm. what they were talking about. And you know, so any facts that you misrepresented is you were misrepresenting from them. From them. And I'm just saying this is what was talked about. And one of the things they were talking about was that Nicaragua, the past couple of years, have taken over Dominican uh, imports. Okay. And um, they think that this coming year or something, they, they have, uh, well, a couple of years from now, um, their crop was fantastic, and wait till you see what's going to come out, because they have fantastic crop, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, they, they're up against a few different things, and one of the things is labor costs. And that if they had their factory in Nicaragua, that they could have the cigars much lower in price, or they m- make lots more money, because the labor costs are up to four times Times the amount that they are in the DR in the DR yeah and um, Skip said that's not true blah 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 and gets in a whole long thing and uh, it's not quite it is there is a difference but it's not quite that amount but is it do you know of I to be honest either don't know the no. difference between the DR I haven't been up on uh, the labor rates it's yeah. probably definitely a bit higher but did did we find out the exact? Uh, I, I had done it on a previous show. I actually had from the government yeah. of what the labor rates were across oh, the country of there. Yeah. And it, it certainly was dramatically different. The lowest being Cuba, of course. Yeah. Um, and their cigar is a high price, so it shouldn't have a, it doesn't have a bearing on they have low yeah. price and they could go higher up there. You have expensive cigars out of Nicaragua. You have expensive cigars in the Dominican Republic. I don't know. How is that a problem to have one year where the crop is just unbelievable from a yeah. blender's perspective? Of course. Because now you're, you, you may have more flavor or more pepper or more of something that you're not looking for necessarily. Definitely. Every crop could be definitely different. I mean, this year in the Connecticut River Valley, there's a lot of rain. Um, so you had a lot thinner broadleaf tobacco coming out of the crops. Uh, out of the field so and you had a lot of rain in the curing barns so i was definitely very selective in the crops that i chose this year because i'm looking for some heavier heavier leaf and you will definitely see a variation and they had they uh, had the opposite that they didn't have much rain at all and they they although the leaves didn't grow to a giant size they said they're so hardy they're so fantastic and that they were going uh, some people i talked to said for the first time we're going to actually plant again because it was a second planting. This was where? Dominican Republic. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. was there some hurricanes? I know Cuba got hit up, too, I think, by some big storms and whatnot. Well, they, their growing season is about 100 days. Is that what you're looking at down there? Yeah. I mean, yeah. We're, we're just starting. I mean, we've been growing since the dry, uh, dry season kicked in. So you're talking November time. You're starting yeah. planting until rainy season starts again in May, the end of May. So, do, do you ever see people try to get a second crop going? I've seen some experimenting, yeah. but mainly the hardcore guys, they won't do that. It's just, um, you know, if, if you, when you cut the plant, uh, the plant will continue to grow and you'll have a second, a second grow coming through. But what happens is the tobacco starts to become very bitter. Ah. And then you start s- to suck a lot of nutrients out of the so, land, yeah. and then you have to let it rest for even longer. So it's ah. a sometimes dangerous it depends on what state they were in to do that um and you know how how the field and soil conditions are All but, right so they were um, they were messing around with that and I, I thought that was interesting sometimes in more of the uh, ma- you know more mass-produced cigars yeah they'll grow tobacco and it will keep growing you can do three four um sometimes they'll use that for short filler okay two kind of crops because they're able to get more tobacco out of it get it a little bit more inexpensive and then they'll end up cutting that with other other short yeah. fills, to, so you, it's not complete. But then next year, you think that the ground got hurt? Because I yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you know, yeah, definitely. You got to be careful. All right. Um, and that's you notice that in different areas, especially in Brazil, is uh, we call Matafina mm. tobacco. You have plantation grown Matafina, and then you have Mata Norte, which is another smaller, small crop. Yeah. Um, and those fields that are larger, 
you definitely don't have the strength in the body and the that you do of the smaller crops all right so good all right let's find out what's up in the cigar world with barry stein it's time for what's, what's up? up in the cigar world brought to you by recluse cigars you want to know what's up <coughs> recluse cigars is what's up voted the 2015 cigar of the year is the recluse amadeus reserva habano Every Recluse cigar goes through eight, count them, eight fermentation cycles over the course of two full years. They are box-pressed and rolled end to bar for a perfect draw every time. If you haven't done it yet, be sure to try a Recluse cigar today. And it's been a busy legislative week, and we'll start with New Mexico, which saw a bill reintroduced that would raise the cigar tax by 204%. Which is from 25% up to 76%. I always wonder why they get these odd numbers. 204%. Not 200%. 204%. And Wyoming also followed suit with a proposed increase of their own that would raise the tobacco tax 167% from 20% from 20% to 53 and a third percent. Meanwhile, Hawaii has seen that exorbitant tobacco taxes don't work. And they proposed a 50% cap on their 50% cigar tax. And Nebraska has done the same with a 50 cent yeah, cap so as just well. Yeah, so everybody should do it. Just 50 cents and that's it. You know, and, and you, you'll make more money. Yep. Rhode Island is a perfect example of it. Many, many years ago, they made that change over, and they tested it for three years, and then they just continue it on. And I believe Connecticut did the cigar tax it, cap, too. Yeah. Yeah. And you just uh, drive it out of, out of state, right? Right. The state of Indiana has proposed raising the age to purchase tobacco from 18 to 21. However, the bill contains an exemption for those who turn 18 before June 30th, 2019, and those who serve in the armed forces. It is currently illegal to buy any type of beverage, be it alcoholic or non-alcoholic, in the state of Maine. A a Maine representative introduced a bill that will allow cigar shops to be classified as a cigar lounge, allowing them to sell their choice of alcoholic or non-alcoholic drinks. Giddy up. Yeah. Our friend Omar DeFrias, who once experienced not receiving a check during the government shutdown when working with NASA, announced his brand is offering a discount in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area to furloughed government workers via various local tobacconists. We'll see if that starts up in three weeks or not. And finally, the cigar... It's over. Yeah. Well, for three weeks. Okay. And then we'll see what happens in three weeks. Finally, the cigar industry lost a legend this week as Master Roller Maria Sierra passed away. Yeah. Maria was one of the first women to roll cigars at El Aguito factory in Cuba before relocating to Miami where she worked for El Titan the Bronze. She rose to fame where she was the only person to roll the La Polina Goldie, Goldie in its entirety from, from the uh, bunching to the wrapper. Nice. And it was modeled after her specialty, which was the Cohiba Corona Especialis. And she was 70 years old, and that's what's up in the cigar. Yeah, she had retired before, right? She retired two years ago. Yeah, yeah. So she be a year and a half. Piece. Yeah. Um, next week on the show, it's Dos Ombre Day, and Dos Ombre uh, is a cigar brand I put out 29 years ago. I did some wow. research, my, my first private label. It's 2 2. It's February 2nd Mm -hmm. next week, so I said, let me tell the story of uh, how that happened, and we're going to talk about value cigar brands, including the Charter Oak that's on my list, because another great value cigar, and um, it's always looked at. Is is there some value cigars out there that uh, you think? Let us know. Uh, Go to the Contact Us page of the Cigar Authority. Let us know know your value cigar brand. Maybe we don't know what it is, but um, a good brand for the price is what we're looking for. Nice. So that's that. Okay. Um, skipped over the uh, asylum, just so you know. Ah, I skipped over asylum. All right. Sorry about that, Ed Sullivan. Want to do that? Well, let's go ahead and do that. All right, let's do it. Let's take a peek into the asylum from our friends at Asylum Cigars. They're coming to take me away, ha-ha. They're coming to take me away, ho-ho, hee-hee, ha-ha. To the funny farm where life is beautiful all the time. And I'll be happy to see those nice young men in their clean white coats. And they're coming to take me away, ha-ha. It's time for news from the Insane Asylum. Odd and sometimes historic news stories that are too insane to be true. Or are they? Brought to you by Asylum Cigars. Take no prisoners. Asylum Cigars are truly flavorful, medium-bodied Nicaraguan cigars with sizes ranging from 4 by 44 to the absolutely insane 8 by 80 Asylum Cigars. And this week, I'm going to change things up. Instead of a story, we have a question. 
what do iPhone, Android, Facebook, YouTube, MySpace, Instagram, Tesla, Spotify, Skype, Twitter, LinkedIn, Gmail, Uber, Airbnb, Google Maps, SoundCloud, Nintendo Wii, Netflix, Dropbox, Hashtags, Reddit, and the Cigar Authority all have it common. Um, Tesla and the Cigar Authority. The answer is none of them existed when Tom Brady won his first Super Bowl. Oh. And that's not only insane, <laughs> it's a silo. <laughs> wow. That's right. New England Patriots. You New England fan? You know, I, I'm a football fan. I love New England. Uh, I don't have one team, though. No? No. I've been living in Nicaragua, too. So you might as football. well have New England because it's the only team. And <laughs> <laughs> they're so hated. I was a Bears so fan. 1985, we beat you yeah. guys. Yeah. yeah. That was my The hated. Bears. The Bears. Jim McMahon. Bury the Bears was the uh, yeah. catchphrase, and we didn't do we didn't pull that off. But it's a dynasty now. Yeah, it's now. ridiculous. What a game! What wow. a game! They always seem to come back. I don't watch too much during the, during the year. I saw the game. Yeah. Oh my God! I just knew they were going to win because right. it happens. You know, all the you, time. Know gonna, you know how it's going to. You know They just come back out. with a couple minutes left. Well, I want to get to this this segment right now because I want these guys to be uh, sitting around after the fact of it. So I'm going to go into the Don Raphael Offer of the Day right now. And the Don Raphael Offer of the Day is brought to you by Don Raphael Cigars. Everyone has a price. Would you do this for the Don? And if so, how much? And this was uh, someone in our audience that gave me this idea. And uh, I thought it was great just last week. And I said, uh, we're going to actually pull this off because I think the guys will, will possibly do it. And this would be nice uh, video or even audio. It might sound good on audio. So I'm going to give you 50 bucks. And I'm going to really do it. 50 bucks. Eat six raw eggs. And I happen to have a dozen raw eggs right here. Ed Sullivan, I'm going to say no to you. Yeah, I'm mm. out. Yeah, but I think six is a little over the top. I probably would have done three. Three for 20. We're having a uh, special today. <laughs> three, three for 20. <laughs> three for 50 I would have done with no problem. But six, six, six is gonna a be a, that's going to be a little tough to swallow. He's a cage-free. Uh, I don't need him thrown up on Grade A large eggs. I'm not doing that. Come on. No. Six eggs, 50 bucks. You're just going to swallow it down. You got no magic bullet. I can't make them scrambled. They're not scrambled. They're going to be raw eggs in a glass. We're going to do the Rocky thing right now. I think you kind of have to do it because of the music. Yeah. It's Godfather music. It's a Godfather. Music, but he know? never like, saw the I Godfather. Would, I know. He has no That's idea what I, this I is. Wouldn't know. You, you, I think you just have to do it because you haven't seen the Godfather. I've three seen, three I've for seen 20. Rocky. Three for 20. No. Three Come for on. I, gotta, I thought for sure both of you would do this. Barry, three for 20. Not for 20. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I wish I had. I have 10 bucks. I'll put it into that. <laughs> There's 30. Three for 30. $10 That's a good an egg. Yeah. Mm. No. Yeah. Still. Oh, they, they talk three the talk. Three for 100% I'll do. I'll give you each five bucks for doing one. <laughs> <laughs> five bucks each for one. I would do one for the hell of it. Oh, you get to drink it out of a cup? Yeah. Oh, that's so a So everybody story. can see. You want one? No. For the hell of it? I don't want Not the five bucks, one. but I'll do one just to show you I could do it. I'll do one. This is uh, riveting radio here. <laughs> just make sure there's no shells. I don't want to be choking on anything. No shells. Yeah, put that there's in one. the ashtray. That's good. Put it in the ashtray like we told people not to do. There's, there's one. Is. That's for, <laughs> for Have these parents. been stored properly? Yes, stored they properly. They're ice cold. You gotta hold on because he's gonna do well, tap glasses yeah. and have a little chair here. <laughs> Got a toast. Made e the eggs are on my diet. E so. eggs, eggs go with a toast, so. None for you, John. No, I'm out. Oh, wow, man. it's a chicken shit. This guy. <laughs> Salute. <laughs> Everybody's Not bad. fine? Tough going down. <laughs> oh, that was good. That was tasty. It's fine, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've. I've Done raw eggs before. It's just six is a that little, six little much. That was a little. Uh, yeah, because I figured yeah. I figured it fill the glass. See, up one nice. egg is one swallow. Six but is at least six swallows. So you thought three you could probably do in one gulp. If six it, would be multiple gulps, and that's where the problem yeah. occurs. Yeah. If we were all hitting the gym hard, it probably yeah uh, we could do it. Three for twenty right now. Still, <laughs> <laughs> I'm all right with the one to prove I could do it. All right, I need something to wash that down. Now. There we go. Uh, gonna be you a man. Any bacon. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, that's the Don Raphael off of the day. I thought for sure, guys, I was going to uh, slam that. But uh, So what, what are early <laughs> chat, ra- chat room wants to know what would you rather do, drink the egg or retro hell? <laughs> uh, that's close. You're not so a retro tell him he doesn't retro hail. Tell him you don't retro hail. No, you haven't smoked a cigar yet. That's uh, okay. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but you you know, your old factory there is. Uh, I, I get the of principle yeah. of it, but it just burns and it, it's okay. like. So you have to do it through time. It's like training. It's like uh, working out. You got to do it step by step. You got to adjust your old factory. So you do three quarters and then a quarter exhale through the or Blow start out slow. a quarter. He holds yeah. it all his mouth. Yeah, yeah. You know you what? You have I'm, a tough time doing it. Is everybody that the thing? tries to teach me how to do it and every oh, you don't time know how to do I it. hack. No, I know how to oh. do it. But it's like getting water up your nose in a swimming pool. Quick, what am I doing? Yeah. I'm scrambling the egg. <laughs> <laughs> He's shaking his belly. Those oh, that are listening yeah. and I can't unsee that. <laughs> I was doing the truffle shuffle. Oh, I can't unsee that. <laughs> and a little pressure behind my fly here. Yeah. <laughs> Have you guys had uh, ribbon candy before? Yes. If anybody knows days. about ribbons, it would be you. Mm. So the the clove one. Clove. I'm getting a little bit of clove and sweetness out of this uh, CBT. Yeah, here. it's a little cinnamon, little cinnamon <coughs> burst. I don't know about cinnamon. Little red hot fireball. Mine tastes like sunny side up. Yeah. Sunny side you, Yeah, you guys are tasting nothing but eggs on the other end? Oh, uh, yeah. I can't really taste anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the, the dried apricot was really hitting me, though. No, Good I Good construction, the, this, great draw. Not overpowering by any means. Yeah, uh, definitely. There's definitely some dried fruit. This yeah, I got a lot of that. The apricot. Honduran yeah. tobacco to Nicaraguan tobacco. Yeah, in the Similar, some in the, great growing regions yeah. in, in, in Honduras, uh, definitely. You definitely have more of that volcanic activity in, in Nicar- Nicaragua, but yeah. there's some great so, tobaccos. Some of the Paris. fields are actually not that far from each other. Right in the north, yeah. so you have Jalapa, and then you cross over to that Hamastron right. Valley. Um, Which yeah, is some, where this is from. Yeah, some yeah. great tobacco in that region. Definitely. Do you, when you're smoking a cigar or you're sampling tobacco, are you identifying food flavors or are you identifying the tobacco components when you're smoking? Um, a little bit of both. And the overall, I'm looking for, again, the overall experience because if you don't get into the, the those fine nuances, you know, at the end of the day, does the tobacco... Key for me is make your mouth water. I don't like cigars that dry out your palate. A lot of that has to do with acidity within the leaf. Sure. So I want that experience. But again, at the end of the day, was it satisfied? Did it jade my palate in any way? And that, you know, bitter, is it hitting me there, you know, in the back of the throat? Olfactory definitely comes into play for me. Um, just in the process of selecting tobacco, I, I started doing it really, um, you know, many years ago. So it's sort of adjusted uh, my olfactory to it. But um, yeah, a little bit of both. So triple Maduro, supposedly. This is triple Maduro. Triple Maduro. That's what's happening here. I love triple Maduro. Yeah. Yeah. So you would think? I would think it's not going to burn well, and it is burning well. You know, I'm not really familiar with the exact definition of the triple m- Maduro. If it's, right. if it's referring to color or also uh, some sort of process in the fermentation. But if you're taking it longer in the fermentation piles and the leaf has the strength and the cellular walls on the leaf, it's going to get darker and be able to withstand more in fermentation. Hence, it's going to get darker. Yeah. So we, so did, we didn't take it, it apart. But it would be sweeter at that point. More concentrated, sweeter. Potentially, potentially. You got to be careful also not to take it too far because what you're happening is when you get those temperatures up, it's almost like when you're cooking and stuff is, you know, boiling. If you let it sit for too long, all of it is evaporating into the elements. Mm. The same can be true in the fermentation process. So it's a balance. Um, definitely, for, you know, the sweetness actually came in broadleaf in, you know, the late 1800s. They were actually shipping tobacco to Germany, and that's when the term sweating and fermentation happened because when they noticed by the time the tobacco arrived in port in Germany, it was sweeter, it was ah. more palatable, and it had started going through this fermentation and bulking process. So that's, that's what Gen- uh, General Cigar or Culbro used to do is winter sweat. And send it off to Dominican yeah. Republic or sure. Jamaica at one time sure. for its winter sweat. You still do that. In yeah. The valley. Oh, yeah. really? Oh, yeah. Sweating is still okay. still very much a part of it. Yeah. After it comes off the fields, so it, it really helps too with the colors 
of the tobacco too to right. even out the colors especially for wrappers uh you know it's got to be such a flawless looking aesthetically pleasing leaf which is a challenge at do you times. do anything in in uh barrels any aging in barrels no it's, no it's been a while yeah uh you know back in the day i was experimenting um actually i had some pappy van winkle uh barrel sent sent down to nicaragua oh. and uh 2012 13 i cold called pappy van winkle from nicaragua talked to him for about a half an hour that's how that happened yeah and wow. after you know i was talking to this gentleman i said uh, you know who do i have the pleasure of speaking with it was julian van winkle I, and it was right before thanksgiving at that time i sent him a bunch of cigars he called me up after he said everybody they were the talk of thanksgiving what could i do for you i said mr van winkle if you could send me uh put me on the list for a 20-year barrel uh, I'd be forever indebted, and I got a call uh, about five minutes later, 20-year wow. barrel and two Buffalo Trace barrels, which I had shipped down to Nicaragua when I was curing some filler tobacco. Cold call. Cold call. Wow. Yeah. You never know. You know, this was before Pappy became Pappy. Yeah. I was always in love. I actually had gotten it as a gift from a retailer from Tennessee who had come down to the factory to visit. And this was like 2009, I think. And, of course, the Pappy bottle s stood out to me because so cool with yeah. him smoking a cigar on it. And uh, I didn't really think about it, you know, too much. And it ended up uh, becoming, you know, this big craze. Right. So. Right. Um, yeah. Great. All right, uh, let's take a break. And when we come back, uh, we got some things in the mailbag we'll catch up on. Uh, the matchup of the week, a classic three way if we can squeeze in and more. We got Nick Malillo from Foundation Cigar with us, and we're live from the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. You're listening to The Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. Let's talk a little about Rough Rider cigars. So here is where the motorcycle culture meets Cigar Nation. This badass looking cigar uses the name Rough, but delivers a smooth as silk ride each and every time. Even before lighting one, you can't help but notice it's sweet like honey flavor. Smooth and creamy, resembling slightly sweetened butter. Outstanding! The Rough Rider Cigar is so beautiful in so many ways. We're talking a premium cigar, imported, long filler cigar, but wait till you hear the price. Every cigar is in the $3 price range, that's right. Even the Churchill in the 6x60, every cigar is in the $3 price range. Rough Rider Cigars, there's nothing rough about Rough Rider except the name. Rough Rider Cigars. The following message is brought to you by Drew Estate. Drew Estate, the rebirth of cigars in the new Drew Diplomat app. Join me, Barry Stein, from the Cigar Authority on Drew Diplomat. As you know, I am quite partial to Liga Pavada Number 9 from Drew Estate. So join me for a Liga and share your experience with Drew Estate. And while you're at it, don't forget to check into Two Guys Smoke Shop on the Drew Diplomat app. Drew Diplomat is now available for the iPhone and Android. To learn more about Drew Diplomat, visit DrewDiplomat.com. That's DrewDiplomat.com. You must be at least 21 years of age or older and a resident of the United States, including D.C. To be eligible for membership in this program, other terms and conditions apply. Surgeon General warning, cigars are not a safe alternative to cigarettes. Since 1903, when La Aurora Cigars first opened their doors as the first cigar factory of the Dominican Republic, they have defined Dominican cigar manufacturing. Now, La Aurora continues that innovation with La Aurora Dominican DNA, featuring an exceptional blend whose soul is the Andullo. La Aurora pays tribute to the oldest Dominican tobacco process with a cigar that features tobacco that is part of their heritage and their DNA. The La Aurora DNA features this hard-to-work tobacco that brings the unique characteristics of strength, inspiring aroma and sweetness that creates an exceptional smoking experience that only La Aurora can bring you. Experience La Aurora Dominican DNA with its Cibao Valley Dominican wrapper, an authentic Cameron binder from Africa with fillers from the Dominican Republic, Pennsylvania, Nicaragua and Andullo. Available at top retailers like twoguyscigars.com and is distributed in the United States by Miami Cigar & Company. It's time to light that cigar 
and stay tuned. Ooh. The Cigar Authority will be right back on the United Podcast Network. Jose Dominguez, Jose Dominguez, Jose, Jose, Jose Dominguez. What the hell are you doing? I'm writing a commercial for Jose Dominguez. Well, what you should be doing is talking about how good they are. That Jose Dominguez makes millions of cigars for other people, but saves the best tobaccos and the best blend for his namesake, Jose Dominguez. Not singing a song, if that's what you think you're doing. What I am doing is creating what is known as a donut. Hey, nobody's going to take away your donuts. No, a donut in a commercial is when it starts with a jingle and then the information comes in and then ends with the song again. The information is the filling of the donut. Why does everything you talk about have to center around food and usually donuts? I don't know. Listen, Jose Dominguez cigars come in four great sizes and two wrappers. The mild, buttery, smooth, natural, and the slightly bolder Maduro. And every cigar is about $5. You know as well as I do, Dave, Jose Dominguez is no $5 cigar. It's worth so much more, it's a sensational value. Okay, here's the end of the donut. You ready? Jose Dominguez. Jose Dominguez. Legendary brand opens a new chapter in its storied history with the H. Upman by A.J. Fernandez. The nearly 175-year-old H. Upman brand in collaboration with storied cigar maker A.J. Fernandez bring a medium to full-bodied, sweetly balanced, and yet complex smoking experience. Boasting an Ecuador Sumatra wrapper, this cigar produces incredible aromas and nuances of sweet spices. Today, almost 175 years later, the legacy of H. Upman lives on a brand new take on an age-old brand. Handcrafted in Esteli, Nicaragua by Cigar Master A.J. Fernandez. Available in four sizes, priced under $9. A legendary brand opens a new chapter in its storied history with the H. Upman by A.J. Fernandez. What's going on? This is Robert Kelly from Medfit, Massachusetts, and you're listening to The Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. I hope they have me back. I think I swore too much. You did. <laughs> we're back, and we're smoking the Triple Maduro cigar that they can't call the Triple Maduro because oh. they sold the name, but I can. It's the Aroa CBT. That's Kappa Binder Trippa. We're smoking the Robusto. Welcome back. Nick Melillo with us. Oh, now I got it. It's using it all throughout. Yeah. Yeah. Get it? Got it. Good. But, uh, you know, I look in the, f- the uh, head of the cigar that I have cut, and it looks kind of brownish inside. It doesn't look all that. It looks fairly similar to the outside, I think. Yeah. I should have paid attention before I cut it, but. We're going to have to open it up after yeah. the show. Yeah. See, see if it's for real. But it tastes good. It's burning well. I would imagine that it would be a, a tough thing to burn because typically you're blending a cigar. You need a lower priming, a middle priming, a high priming, thick and thin cigars so that you're going to have the burn proper, right? Yeah. It seems like they got the fermentation down. All right. So you can take anything and thin it out by fermenting it long enough. Long enough. Yeah. Long enough. Yeah. 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 Have, have they figured out a way to... You don't want to do that, though, you know, to the good lijeros. Right. Stick to bat, you know. Because you're going to take the strength away, right? And you're going to take all the goodness away yeah. eventually. But, you know, everybody's blending and, and fermenting tobacco based on what they like. So yeah. Everybody's manufacturer's got their own... And everybody way. likes to try something new, too. The, the creativity in the, in the blending process is amazing of... You know, let, let me take an old seed and let me see what, what this plant's yeah. like you're doing with your cigar. And sure. Everybody's trying to do something. There's a lot of experimenting yeah. going on. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, All the time. Got to keep it fresh, keep it new. Right. That's how the Connecticut Shade came about. We were talking about yes. that before, late 1800s and early 1900s. Sumatra seed from Indonesia was taken over, and Connecticut responded by uh, with the uh, Agricultural Center to develop this Connecticut Shade, which was a hybridization of Sumatra. Havana seed and broadleaf, which unbelievable. Is I yeah. never knew that until yeah. you had said that. Created that the, its own own animal. 
Yeah. And now they're taking that seed and they're growing in other places. Yeah. And we'll see how that tra- It worked out for Ecuador, although different. Yep. Um, Ecuador's got that cloud coverage. Yeah. So, you you know, you don't have to put up all those hundreds of acres of, of cheesecloth tents. So it really took in, in Ecuador the Connecticut shade seed, late 80s, early 90s. And, and, and have they, after... The, they, they put a regular Connecticut seed in there. They grow a plant. They make some more seeds. Now it's a second generation right. seed. Right. And that becomes a different thing. Correct. Yeah. 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 And you're looking for the strongest plants, of course, and, uh, you know, the strongest seeds. But definitely, yeah. Yeah. They so, develop. And a lot of companies are trying to, to develop seeds that then can't be replicated by other companies. Right. So, right. Yeah. Uh, Corojo, for instance, sure. that, yeah, yeah. that uh, people are doing. Very, very yeah. interesting. You got a mailbag you want to squeeze in? Sure. Mr. Jay? This was submitted through the Contact Us page of thecigarauthority.com. And Scott writes, long ashes to the Cigar Authority, longtime listener, second time writer. Just wanted to take a moment and thank Dave, Mr. Jonathan, Barry, and Ed for signing and donating one of our unique cigar rests to the charity raffle. The cigar industry has always been an incredibly charitable and generous, and we all too often neglect to share and report it. Please consider your generosity and charity recognized and appreciated. Your efforts, although they may seem small to you, and I can hear Dave saying, why would anyone want our autographs, uh, will have a big impact (laughs) on putting some stogies and cheroots into the mitts and kits of our servicemen and women around the world. Thank you. Hail hearty fellows, long ashes, and short putts. Signed, Scott, from Centerfire Cigar Rests. Yeah, the, the shame that happened is that we cannot donate to cigars any longer. Crazy. To uh, the servicemen and women that are out there. And the number one asked for thing is cigars. Yeah. And the cigar industry was so unbelievable for manufacturers all the way down to retailers. The amount that they would donate. And unfortunately, that all went away. Which is interesting because World War II, that's, you know, there was a program in place to have cigars being sent to troops overseas. Wow. So that was, you know, your pastime. Yeah. You know? And at the same time that they make um, smoking, you have to be 21 now at a lot of places, but a serviceman can smoke at 18. The only problem is he can't get the cigar anymore. Madness. So. The world's upside down. It's crazy stuff that's going. Right now, it's time for the matchup of the week. Brought to you by VS. VS means versus, but it stands for Victor Sinclair Cigars. Which would you rather do in this hypothetical battle? Would you rather have your significant other look through all your text chats and email history or your employer? And I'd be interested in both Barry and Jonathan on this, seeing they're employed by me. Oh, boy. You can look through my phone anytime you Text, want. Text, chats, and emails. Because I know he's a sick bastard. So what, what more could I possibly say? My wife say? can, too. I, I, anybody can look through my stuff. You got nothing to hide. Nothing. No. I share my browser history on here, so I have no problems. You just don't care. No. I'd probably let, I'd probably let my wife go through everything before you. <clears throat> You would? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> All right. And how about you? Anybody. We can go through it. No problem. Jonathan, maybe but who not. Would you you got to pick one here. Which, yeah. you, which would you I'm rather? Picking, I'm picking my wife. I'd rather have my wife go through everything than you. You. Because you're judgmental. You'd rather me. We, yeah. <laughs> Your wife's not. That's She's good. not judgmental. Yeah. You, you're judgmental. I'd never hear the end of it. Your wife is not judgmental. Not about that stuff. No. No? <laughs> how about you, Ed Sullivan? I'm going with wife. She knows I'm. She knows I'm demented. My employers two don't pe- know. Two people know. don't want me to know what, how sick they really are. Well, it's also like two weeks before Valentine's Day, so oh. I don't want my wife to know what I've been looking for a Valentine's gift. So oh, nice cover, it. buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Nice cover. That was very good. <laughs> that was a very good cover up. I'm gonna let my employer go through my. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I employ myself. So. Yeah. <laughs> And that's why I'm self-employed, folks. <laughs> right? In case this question comes up. Right. In the future. Now, look at anything you want. You, you just understand how boring I am. The ridiculous things I look up. Uh, but I did look up your Sioux thing that you bought this week. Sous vide. Sous vide. Do you know what that is? No. No idea. Sous vide. It's a, uh, it's a device that will attach itself to a pot. And it circulates the water and holds the water to within one degree of a given temperature. 
So we made steak. No stove no needed. Right. We made steak this week, and I made it for everybody. And Ed Sullivan and Dave were tied up, so they couldn't eat at the same time as everybody. So I just left theirs in their bags in the water. Plastic bags. So they were ready. So it stirred the steak? It just kept it at that temperature, and then you still sear it. And gotcha. you can bring it up to the final temperature. And you cut, op you cut the steak open, and it was absolutely perfect all the way through. Really? And supposedly restaurants are doing this now, and you don't know it. Interessante. Yeah, you go to a high-end restaurant. If you ever, if you cut into a steak, you get something that's on the rare side, and you cut into it, you'll see the sear marks on the very top and the very bottom, and that's it. The rest of it is pink all the way through. Fascinating. If it's rare. Yeah. You're so psyched about it's that. The, so the I, best. yeah, I looked <laughs> it up and I said it's pretty interesting that they're doing things in cooking that you never thought could happen, but it's, awesome. it's still happening. It's so you still, might be a disaster in the kitchen, but I'm pretty good in the kitchen. But I would I be know, a disaster yeah. blending cigars. Right. I want to try to use that in the fermentation. I'd want to do <laughs> an all Connecticut shade cigar, and then that's it really could, couldn't do yeah. that. I mean, you could, but. Bitter, terrible. I think it would be a bit too much. Yeah. I like to too you. much of a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't. Right. If you've ever had cigars when they do tasting seminars and things and they give you one kind of tobacco, it usually doesn't taste very good at all. And then you taste the other kind of tobacco. That doesn't taste very good at all. And here's the third one. That doesn't taste good. And then here they are, all three together, delicious. How does that happen? The next time I see you, I'm going to remind me. I'll, I'll roll one up for you. Yeah, so something yeah. that's good. Well, no, it's Connecticut Shade. No, no, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Try Connecticut Shade. I'll bring some other good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Connecticut Shade by itself, I can't envision. I mean, it should be nice and smooth. You're probably going to get a lot of bitterness, potentially. Yeah, but you never know. Well, Jonathan's a bitter person. So. It'd be interesting to take different seeds grown, some Connecticut Shade from Connecticut, from Ecuador, from Honduras, and different mm -hmm. areas. Try all of them. Try them together. Yeah. That could be interesting. Could be the High Clare Castle too. <laughs> new Mudo <laughs> Due. Yeah, we we might you might be seeing a new High Clare Castle at the show. This ah, year we'll get even so more information here. A little bit more information of a Maduro version. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit darker leaf. Yeah, yeah. good, yeah. good. And would it be Connecticut Broadleaf? Mm, not necessarily. No, that's not a no. necessarily, but so you never Candela. know. I'm working on a few things. No, it's gonna be it's gonna be uh, San Andreas wrapper. You know, I've never worked on the, with um, uh, the uh, Cuban Cuban seed Ecuador a lot. Some of the higher primings of Cuban seed Ecuador. In turn that to Maduro. Yeah. Oh yeah. You oh, know, okay. all of the you know, a lot of companies, you know, use this and you have a Sumatra seed in Ecuador, but the upper primings get really dark. Yeah. It's not going to be necessarily a triple Maduro, no. but it's going to be more yeah. on that uh, <laughs> you know, Colorado to Maduro, that Colorado Maduro. Colorado is a missed thing. Remember all the brands that would have right. Colorado, Colorado Love Claro, that. Claro, yeah, yeah. The Rothschilds, the yes. Punch Rothschilds, you know, you'd have yeah. uh, you know, double uh, the Maduro Maduro. Oscuro. Yeah. They, there then, used to be a much bigger clarification of color. It was a challenge from the store because, you, get, you know, the guy would get stuck on the Colorado Maduro and then you'd yes. always only have that one. Yeah. Then you'd take them out and put them in that box and they... With the, yeah. with the punch. <laughs> they, they were un, un cellophane, unbanded cigars. Yeah. Just take them out of one and put it in the other. Oh, I got some right over here. Okay. <laughs> and they were pretty much the same as the same. Hoya uh, yeah. ones, I think. It was, just color, right. it was just a color sort of thing. And there's yeah. manufacturers right now that have the natural and Maduro version. Yeah. There's a simple color sorting is all that happens. And that happened in the, the Indonesian Sumatra market, the Dutch, and the, in the European market, they would have literally like 30 color sortings. I've seen it before. It's amazing. Yeah. Why put I yourself know. through that stress? Such a keen eye, these people have. Yeah. 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 There was uh, Puros Indios, remember? They used Puros to, Indios was yeah. my favorite cigar in 1996. Yeah. Tom Selleck episode. episode <laughs> ver uh, cigar PI? aficionado. Oh, okay. 1996. That issue had Opus X number two, Monte Cristo number two, and the Puros Indios number two, all with this 92 or 94 rating, yeah. all the same. It was on fire. I was actually lucky enough. I was in the early, the first dozen retailers to end up having them. Couldn't even keep them in stock. Couldn't. I had to good. travel at least an hour and a half to find them. And in those days also, another hot thing that was there was shaped cigars. Yeah. That they were on fire, and that was uh, partly because construction problems would happen, so people would go to 
shapes the guys, the best rollers were on them, yeah. and sure. uh, you'd have a better chance of, of it. I'm finding that shapes the guys, for us anyway, and we went through all the sizes at the end of the year to see what sold, torpedoes and things in, it's in shapes. It's interesting, because they were hot They were then. hot. Getting a number two torpedo or a bellicoso, yeah. that was like the, the in thing. Yeah, all the Hemingway stuff yeah. and all that, uh, which leads me to Cameroon. Do you ever mess around with Cameroon at you all? Know, um, Is that the messing around with the little of the grasshopper? Cam- you know, you never know. I hear that. Know. I hear that's dramatically improved over the years now. It's. Uh, I think there's been some improvements. Yeah. Um, it's you know definitely a tough growing growing region and. Um, Typically, the Cameroon was actually brought to Cameroon, Africa, I think, in the early 60s. It's a Sumatra seed that was brought to Cameroon and grown, and um, a lot of different political situations right. going on there and how tobacco is grown and Do you ever go there? Did. No, I haven't no. been there yet. I was, uh, t- I was told not to. I, I wanted to go years ago. Yeah. Uh, Mirafeld, politi- yeah, when, sure. when he was still around, Sure. Um, he, I had talked to him, and I said, you know, I'd really like to go see it. And he said, no, you wouldn't. And I said, yes, I would. And we went to the back and forth for a while, and he goes, don't go. Yeah. So it's that dangerous. Some political uh, instability yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's the way that is. I have a prediction. Not all grasshoppers are green. So his rapper's going to be Ooh. Cameroon and Candela. Ooh. A little pinstriping around it. Ooh. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to do the pinstriping. I don't, I don't see I don't him as that. I don't, I'm not see a, that. I don't but, uh, know. But, but a you dual never know. rapper, maybe? You never know. You might see some variation in between the pack of cigars. It might not all be the same. Mm. Ah. You know? the, the one special green one that's in the middle of the you box. You never know. And everybody goes to try to get the green one. The lucky, <laughs> the lucky one. Or well, unlucky in my case. Candela. <laughs> Never took a good tasting to it, although... It was big there in the 50s, 60s there. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was. And, and with domestic cigars, machine-made cigars, still to this day, I mean, they make millions and millions yeah. of Candela. Uh, wouldn't that life be easy if you were using Candela yeah. uh, in an easy process? But uh, Hopefully I can develop uh, s- something that you could smoke. All right. I'm working on it. It's definitely a tough, tough one to blend with. I'll tell you who did it the best was we uh, Skip Martin Roma Craft. Okay, nice. Yeah. It's for Marion. Very good. It, it was very good. I, I was shocked uh, that yeah. You know, if I, my eyes were closed, I probably wouldn't pick that out. And when, when the whole Candela thing first started, well, not when it first started, but when they started doing the releases near St. Patrick's Day, Illusioni had did a Candela. Yeah. Their first one was phenomenal. I never had it. That was a good smoke. Then it yeah. changed a little bit, and it kind of disappeared. Yeah. Tough one to sell. Yeah. That's a tough selling one, uh, but one in the box would be okay. You know, <laughs> v- uh, variety is the spice of life. All they right. say. This is and this folks. You're very tight lipped, and you're you're you're, you're not taking really. Us down, this show, I mean, I let out some us down big these odd the rabbit holes that aren't aren't going to mean anything. I'm not falling for this. Really? I'm when we do our show, it. and I you, tell you my guesses, I don't know. This is where this. they come from. I have these conversations <laughs> with a lot of people, and I get these ideas, and uh, comes from there. I think you're trying to throw me off because I nailed it that you have Candela inside, and you don't want to admit that. So you're trying to take us down this other road of maybe it's one. This guy. Yeah. It's not that. Know, you know. Conspiracy theorist. I know. I'm a conspiracy factualist. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we got some, some new things uh, that he's coming out with, though. I think we got some information, which is what we wanted to do. And we certainly learned a lot about... Uh, You're welcome Connecticut, knowledge. Connecticut stuff. Anything you, you want to add to what you said about Connecticut that somebody doesn't would want to know or doesn't about, need to know? About Connecticut? Yeah. Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't it, know. It, is it going to go away eventually? That no, I think it's it's really strong at this at this point. I mean, Broadleaf has really come back into popularity over the past. Uh, 10, well, you got to look at 10, gen- generations. Is the, is the younger generation that the guy that has the farm now and he loves yeah. it, and that's what he wants to have? Is the kids going to say we're selling this? Property. You're going to start seeing. I think eventually you're going to see a new sort of seed variety come out of Connecticut with time. All right. So there's some there's some experiments constantly happening with the experiment station in, in Connecticut, and I think you're going to see an evolution because of the loss of the Connecticut shade seed over the years. Yeah. To, you know, maybe there's 50, 60 acres left in the valley of Connecticut shade being grown. Um, you're going to see either more of a Cuban seed variety um, or a hybrid of broadleaf and maybe some other seeds. Will, will I possibly see Nick Malilla? owning a tobacco farm in Connecticut someday? No comment. Ah, 
That means he already owns one. No, that's that's a non-denial. You know, I'm honored right now. We're on the Thrall <laughs> Farms um, yes. in Connecticut and Windsor, and the Thrall family goes back to the 1600s in Connecticut and was one of the biggest shade growers in Connecticut. So it's a real honor to be right in one of one of the most historic farms in in the valley right now. So, but um, you're going to be seeing some interesting things from Foundation over All the next right. couple I, I've, of years. I've never had, uh, got the invite, but I'd like to come see it someday. This summer let's do it yeah let's I'd do love it. to see it and uh, we should do another uh, presentation uh, we'll go from uh, 25 uh, uh, 2.5 million years and we'll go through every detail there we go because we did it before the show even started he actually gave me a book book on it and uh, it, it's amazing that it's right here in our backyard and uh, we, we have of all odd places Connecticut growing some of the best tobacco in the yeah. world Dave just found yeah. a way to get an invite to yeah. go get no, the pizza great. again. Oh, pizza. He's, oh. He wants to go to get the pizza, oh. and he's also going to see you. Worcester Street Pizza, you're going to have to come <laughs> Oh, down. I don't know that. I, we go to Frank Pe Pepe. Yeah, yeah that's, Frank, that's Worcester oh. Street in uh, New oh. Haven, Connecticut. Okay. Um, I actually live on, on that street. Really? And you have two little <laughs> how, Italy. How are you so thin? <laughs> Italy, yeah, that's how I gained all the weight. Sure. <laughs> I was eating pizza, and they make uh, Fox and Park soda, which is a local soda. And I was wiling out on pizza. Pizza and soda. I love it. Yeah. And all yeah, the, are you in? Of all course. The, the team were cigar smokers, so that doesn't help over at Pepe's. So, uh, yeah, I would get You into live the on that street. I live right on that street. My great-grandfather, when he came to Italy in 1920, uh, first came to Worcester Street in that time. Little and there's Italy. a lot of good food out there. Incredible oh, yeah. food. New Haven's got some incredible food, but these this street particularly, Peppy's and Sally's, you have the coal ovens that are from the late 20s that's mm. still in existence. So, I mean, there's lines around the block, literally, almost every day. And, and how is that compared to Frank Peppy's? Oh, Sally's is delicious too. It's always the war uh, oh. between. Uh, yeah, we'll, some, we'll be do the a tasting thing. We'll, we'll be the both. judge. We'll have yeah. a pie each at one and a pie so, each of the other. So coming back, yeah. we stopped at a Buffalo hot wing place, right? right? Yeah, which was surprisingly good. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Any idea what that was? The Buffalo Wings place? Yeah. yeah. Is it a chain? No. Oh. No, I'm not familiar with no, that. No, we were driving around. We, we just pulled off the road, road and said, yeah. let's find something, and yeah. we found this gold as far as I'm concerned, but we can't find it again. That was coming back from Mickey Blake's. Oh, sure. really? Yeah. Yes. So, okay, so it was like 11 o'clock at night. Nothing yeah. was open. We found this place that was open. And it was a 10. It was it perfect. Was best wings I've had. Yeah. Beautiful okay. Thing. All right. That's it. Thank you so much for coming Gosh, on the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks for staying yeah, on through the whole you. thing. Mm -hmm. uh, final thoughts here on Aroa CBT. What do we think? I'm still picking up that, uh, that clove sweetness. Like if you had a honey baked ham and you just doused it with a little clove to it. <laughs> Some crickets. Ed Sullivan says you're not even close. Apricots, licorice, a little bit of cedar. Mine tastes like raw egg. Yes, yeah, still. <laughs> Yeah, still. <laughs> the vic viscosity of a raw egg. Mr. Jonathan, last chance That's to good, redeem yourself no. because everybody's going to going to get mail on this one. That's fine. Big talker. So I'm going to stop bringing cash every single week because he talks and talk. Yeah, I'd do it, and he's not going to do anything. You lowered the price. It was like five hundred dollars before, and then five, now you drop it down to well, twenty, but three for twenty. Well, yeah. I said fifty dollars. You for, said I'll do three, and I said okay, three for twenty. For five hundred? No, that was Barry. For five hundred dollars, I'll eat six eggs. Five hundred. Five hundred. Crazy. <laughs> Means he won't do it. That's it. Okay, that's it for us. Uh, next week we're talking value cigars, cigar brands that are underrated because they are underpriced. They'll get. They would get more attention if they were priced higher. We're going to look into that. I think there's something that, and we'll be the judge. Until then, you've been listening to The Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. And uh, you've actually probably learned something over the last two hours, but always remember to keep the lid end out of your mouth. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.